Hello, everybody. There's a commercial. No. I hope you're all doing marvelously well. You probably recognize this gentleman in the middle who's picking his nose. <laughs> Mark Daniel Nelson, how are you? I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Good. And you brought along a friend, Mr. Brian Carr. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Great to be here. How's it going? Good, good, good. This is going to be fun because um, you, you, you probably are both very aware the number one thing that everybody in music wants to do is to get into film and TV. <laughs> I'm sure you're very, very, very aware of that. I'm aware. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it sort of became the great gold rush about 15 years ago, didn't it? It was like, it was like suddenly everybody was like trying to license music, and it's very, very competitive in that world. And uh, yeah. some of my experiences have been interesting because I'll get an artist coming to me, and we'll spend like a month negotiating a contract, and then they'll just give away their music to some licensing house, you know, for next to nothing. So, God bless it. But you guys work together a lot on yep. some uh, movie stuff that you obviously score and compose and yep. all of the other catchphrases. I love <laughs> what I've heard of your work. Thank you very much. Thank I you. mean, the orchestral stuff. I, growing up from a classical background, that was my whole household was full of classical music. Did you have that same experience? A bit. Yeah, I, I, I think all I think most composers I know had a bit of it, at least. Um, some of us had piano lessons at, at varying times or guitar lessons, but it's very helpful to have a, an instrument that you kind of grow up with that you can write on later that, it, that, that will enable you to easily uh, work your way into a, a sort of functional relationship with a DAW, as it turns out. We all, work, we all play the computer now, much more sure. than we can play uh, piano or guitar a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I had piano lessons when I was a teenager, and then I went to school and studied um, theory and composition and, and got degrees in, in that and that can be useful but I don't think it's necessary you can uh, you can learn as an apprentice you can you can just hustle uh, so whatever works for you uh, is is probably the best path for you right did you but you you worked on rock and roll projects and I'm sure you continue to do that anyway sure yeah like a lot of people I grew up playing in bands in high school and they never went anywhere of course because I'm from a very small town we didn't really aspire to that necessarily but you know, um, after college, getting degrees, I moved to L.A. and didn't really know exactly where I was going to land in the, in the whole landscape. And so, yeah, I, I ended up participating um, as a keyboard player and a string arranger on a couple things. I worked with Colby Calais and, and, uh, and uh, another artist named um, and Michael Blue who produced all that stuff. And, and um, yeah, got, got a little bit of a foot in. And that gradually led to like a, a, an opportunity to audition for a family guy, um, a, a place on that team, you know, as an orchestrator and, a, and it's kind of a, a support person who I've produced pop songs and dance tracks and all kinds of non orchestral stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, that's kind of sounds like a dream, doesn't it, Mark? You know, like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. a, a family guy. I mean. How much yeah. cooler does it get than that? <laughs> well, when I when I got the chance to do it, I, I, I didn't really watch the show. And I told my wife and she, she wasn't my wife at the time, but I told her and she was like, oh, my gosh, that's a huge show. And I was like, OK, cool. It's a I got really fortunate that that turned into something. So so yeah. let me let me get this right. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're playing in bands. You've got. Went to school for it, but really it kind of came through rock and roll in some ways. Is that true? It's a very, it's a very uh, balanced, yeah, convoluted kind of situation because um, I, you know, I might have gone the band route had something landed. And I right. think, uh, you know, because I was just kind of open to like whatever was going to work out, I just, I ended up going the direction of the, the TV film thing earlier on because that was, those doors were a little bit more open. Right. Somebody said, how, how does one become an apprentice? I want to go to that question quickly, because that, I thought that was pretty cool, because you did mention that in your sort of uh, beginning. You said, oh, you know, you go to school, you can do this, become an apprentice. Is that still a thing? I it's, actually genuinely want to know. It kind of is. I mean, I think, um, I think just reaching out, believe it or not, reaching out and writing a genuinely interesting email to somebody that you want to work with, or maybe someone you don't even know that you want to work with, but you just Google some people who look like they're doing some work. And I'm only saying this because that's how I got my assistant. He just- Mark, you called it. That's it. You're going to get a thousand emails now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my assistant just reached out to several people that he Googled and thought yeah. they look like they're doing something. I'll just see if they need some help. 
and yeah. he has a really good attitude. His name is Jared Elias. I'm going to give him a shout out because he's a really good kid, and uh, I've really appreciated his help. But I would I would suggest just don't be afraid to to be to be nice. You're probably not going to hear back from 99 percent, but that er one. Eric emailed me. How many people did you email? Uh, like 50, 60, a ton. 50, 60 and people. How many people responded? One. Just me. <laughs> Point made, yeah. yes. And it's all about timing. It's yeah. all about because timing. Because if you didn't answer, I mean, Warren could have been on a call that second he was going to supposed to look at the email, and if he was in a bad mood yeah. off the call or something, he would have just ignored. I mean, that's the biggest. It's You have to just understand that talent is everything, but it's your personality that's more important. Huge. And then it's the timing that goes with the personality. Oh man, I could talk about that for two hours. Yeah, just trying to understand the philosophy of like just because you didn't get it the first time, or just because you didn't get a response from someone that you respect or something, it's not meaning anything against you unless you really knew you did something to cause the issue. But yeah, as a composer, the world is just your oyster. Literally, you could literally wake up one morning create a track, call somebody, have them put it in a docket for a supervision lead, Atticus sees somebody, supervision lead for a trailer and then land that trailer and then pay off your mortgage. I mean, it's literally that crazy. It is crazy. And, and all, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but you really, it, you really do need to have a very good attitude and be very very friendly and very authentic as much as you can. And also just keep trying, be persistent, keep going, keep going and be a self starter, you know, right. continue to work on your craft, write more and more music, better and better music. There's a secret. And that's something I have encountered. I'm sure you have as well, Mark. Pe people send me songs and uh, they're obviously they send me five songs and they'll say, can you reproduce this track or redo this? And I'm like, you know what? It may not be the best production, but it's definitely good enough. I like this. Why do you want to reproduce it? And then they'll have like these minor little quibbles and and all of this happens all the time. And then I realize that people get stuck on those five songs they've written. Yeah. They've written. And I would mm. say, you know, it's a quote from uh, uh, Throw Mama from the Train. It's about writing as in book writing, but it's a great line. Writers write. It's like if you're a composer, compose. Don't rest your laurels on a piece of music you wrote 20 years ago and you keep thinking, what well, if Mark mixes it, it's going to be better. What about if Eric does it? It's like, write, write new stuff. And I think um, it's definitely a yeah. war of attrition, isn't it? You want to have a lot yeah. of irons and a lot of fires. Yeah. Um, and relationships, as you're both basically saying, relationships are super important. And okay. if you keep, you know, rubbing the sticks together to try to create heat, yeah. it will work eventually. It just does. You probably tired. People probably try tired of hearing that. But yeah. it just, it really does. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, that mir mirrors my own experience, to be honest. I mean, I, I've done some big records, but I didn't didn't do them in the first six months of my career. <laughs> yeah. It was a good 20 years in before I was, like, working on bigger records. Yeah. I was doing home, you know, home studio, building it up slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, so, Mark, how did you meet? How did you both meet? Well, we were talking about that. The, the 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 fifth degree to Kevin Bacon thing with, with Eric Boulanger. Yeah, we were talking about a dinner. Oh yeah, everything goes through Eric Boulanger. Eric, how are you? <laughs> Atticus is not wanting to stay still. He keeps. Well, if the gate's shut, we can let him run around the garden. And he'll can start you, you lock licking the, gate? the door. Yeah, you lock the gate and let him come in and out. Okay. The um. Yeah, I think. How did we meet? Ken Kelly? Yeah, it was through Ken. So yeah, we did a. Point Break did that re movie. They did we did Point Break, and we were working on Kobe's Elm at the same time. And I think we had to do a score thing for the movie, and we might as well put strings on Kobe's song. I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. So we did that, and and then um, like four or five months later, you ended up calling about some really neat documentary to do a sound alike at the yeah. legitimate studio at East West in Studio Three to make it sound like this amazing 60s song. And I got the engineer, it was really fun. Yeah, it's it's that Are You Going to San Francisco song uh, from the 60s. Sure. And it wasn't a sound alike, it was a re-record 
like we had to do an exact re uh, reproduction as close within reason as possible uh, because as a licensing issue, a lot of times you can't get the master sync for one reason or another. But if you re-record the song, you can, you can often get the publisher to give you that sync. Um, right. So that's what we did. We re-recorded it with a band that already sounded like a 60s band. And I called Eric Boulanger and said, you know a guy, an engineer that can come and that knows this vibe and knows this room. And he was like, uh, Mark's your guy. <laughs> so uh, brought him in and it, it All was, roads go through Eric. There always, you go. Always. Right. Always. Always. Right. But I think from there, we ended up working on outside projects. And then I got courted to go to Salt Lake City for Warner Chapel for a couple of years. Mm. And that's how I pulled him into the production music universe to get trailer universe, get some universe cooking in that realm of things, I guess. And uh, it's a uh, trailer still Big B. Brian. You still do a lot of those? I, I am doing several recently, actually. I'm working with this company more and more called Divergence Music. My friend Dan Beyer owns it. Shout out to Dan. Great guy. I've known him for a long time. Um, but yeah, we, we just got, uh, we just worked on The Northman and Fantastic Beasts 3. Uh, he's working on a bunch of stuff too right now. I'm but... confused what the Fantastic Beast is. What? Is it Harry Potter? I think it's Harry Potter Universe. But so this is called that? the Secrets of Dumbledore. So it's okay, like I'm a... so confused. This is so virtual. <laughs> you can look this up. Uh, the Secrets of Dumbledore. Somewhere. Yeah. Nice. But that's still a world that um, that's interesting. The music is fun because you're you're kind of having to boil down ideas to their tiniest form in order to give editors a way to grab attention within a genre about a specific moment in the film, and and. And, and trying to bring your focus to that level is a fun exercise and has lots of applications for film scoring in general, in my opinion. That's amazing. Um, so tell us, can you tell us a little bit about your process composing? Are you sitting at a piano? I mean, you mentioned earlier you see your DAW as a tool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is my instrument now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do still sit at a piano um, to write themes. Like when, when you first get a film... You know, I will sit down, a lot of guys do this, I'm not alone in this at all, but you will sit down at a piano and mm -hmm. and I like to have at least a few days, maybe a week or 10 days to just write themes, explore, get to know the movie, get to know the characters, get to know the, the story arcs and get to know the world that the story takes place in. So you want to just sit and be able to write material that you will then draw upon and, and, and distribute into the film as it is appropriate. Um, so you're coming up with textures, you're coming up with sometimes themes. I like themes, so I tend to write themes, and the directors that I work with a lot of time want themes. Um, but it depends on the project. Yeah. Explain what themes are. Themes, you got to talk in terms of, you, you have to sometimes have to sure. try to find ways to let people that have no idea what cues are, or themes, or song. Sometimes you, you have to figure out these ways, and it doesn't mean you have to always say that. Going back to the other video with the cue in the song, I like to give a couple people hell because they, they get upset. Not you. Another composer I work with a lot gets <laughs> mad when I say song. And I'm like, this is it's the same thing. <laughs> so so, so sort to explain of. what a theme is. Well, a theme is just a, a, a short or maybe moderately longer idea that will repeat later that you will have associated with a dimension of the film, whether that's a character, a situation, a, a, a planet, you know, it just depends. And, um, you know, we all know the Star Wars theme. We all know, you know, maybe Jurassic Park. I'm naming a lot of John Williams movies right now because he's one of the most prolific theme writers. But um, I love Elgo. I love Holst. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> and Strauss, right? Um, yes. So oh, sorry, John Williams. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so but everyone to, influences off each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a better way to say it. Is that that we since we occupy music, we occupy a lot of the same mm -hmm. territory, and we're we're kind of flying around each other's universes a lot. Yep. So um, I still want to know a little bit more about your process. So mm -hmm. if you're writing a theme, uh, do you do you do you sit there with? Are you really going to the piano that much these days? Or are you more sort of around a USB keyboard? Are you because? 
I assume, like most of us, you're writing and producing at the same time. Yeah, no, it's a luxury. I will admit that it's a luxury when I have five days to go and spend two of them at the piano. But I do that when I have the time. When I don't have the time, I'm usually at the piano at the DAW. Right. You know, on the keyboard. So so that if something happens, I can just hit record and and and, and grab it. Uh, that that version of it mm -hmm. won't make it into the film. It'll be orchestrated and it'll be, you know, right. so it's not as though, you know, you're going to use a part of your demo. Usually that's very rare. Usually you're just you're just jamming, you know what I mean? OK, to get ideas out. So for orchestration, um, I suppose it's budget dependent, isn't it? Sometimes you're doing sure. it over here. I know um, I did a couple of years ago. We did a, 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 a big record where we went to Mexico. Mm. And um, so I can't remember where it was. I'm trying to remember. Anyway, the orchestra was incredible, and and but Romania gets comes up a lot. I know there's a lot of orchestral stuff that we did when we did the um, Rick Springfield record was done in Romania. Um, are you do you have the luxury of being able to do it in America often and go down and be there when it's um, recorded? Uh, yeah, I mean fairly often. Great. I mean B Budapest has come up frequently for us um, as right. a great solution. But yeah, I, I do things in small and medium and large ensembles here. We did a project. Uh, we worked at Igloo. We worked at Warner. We worked at Sony. We worked at a lot of places. Um, the bridge, the old bridge, I think it's called. What's that place called now? Zoo. Zoo. Yeah, we did a lot of work there. It is budget dependent. And obviously, mm -hmm. we always prefer to uh, do as much live as, as we can. Um, it's not on only project dependent. I think knowing the room and knowing what each room can offer because that there's so many options now nashville salt lake city seattle these non-union rooms that are around the country local are a little less than la because it's it's a network non-union space but these rooms all have their own character too oh they definitely have that's a great so point it's actually. like when we did that thing the other day when I was showing the video of the little orchestra at Igloo versus the big thing at Budapest. You could have easily done the quartet in Budapest, but you no, chose right. to do it because of the sound or the players were specific. The room itself had this very specific sound. So being able to choose that, like Utah still has a really amazing set of players that are incredible, that are just really affordable when you need them. And a good studio out there, Funk Studio is a really nice place. and. Nashville Ocean Way is killer. So I think, honestly, a lot of it is depending. Now, the issue we see is um, when you're talking about many players, obviously price is first, but when you're dealing with orchestra and you're trying to get it to sound cinematic, you want these really big groups. And a lot of the time, if you're not in some hub like LA, by the time you hit your 12th chair player, it starts going quality downhill. Their instruments are cheap and stuff like that. So you, you get the option of going to places like Budapest or Rome or the Czech Republic or wherever you're going to go to get it because you get these players that are all equal, balanced, and they're very large groups of people that play in these very large environments, which is huge for the character. Yeah, it can be. What I'm enjoying about, what I'm enjoying, what I'm hearing about films a lot lately is that the rules for what's cinematic are being completely redefined. And I love hearing that uh, a lot of small string ensembles, affordable, you know, small wind and brass groups in, in funky rooms are showing up on TV and film. And, and I'm going to bring up Dave Pensato here because I love that he, he said once something like, don't quote me, but I think he said something like, uh, I'd rather sound new than good. And we all want to sound good, right? But there sure. is a point to be made about sounding new and leaning on doing something new that might be able to work cinematically without trying to imitate a cinematic sound. Yeah, I, 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 I teach at uh, um, this school called Artes in the ne Netherlands, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And what I do is once a week for two hours, I do a one on one with students. And yesterday, for instance, sorry, I won't say the name of the student, but yesterday, for instance, um, this uh, student sent me like five or six songs and sent me one of the first, uh, sorry, one of the last songs they did first. 
and it was it was really nice but it was really nice it was like very safe and well recorded and very well mixed and we were working backwards and when he got to like song number five which is like one of his earlier songs i was like this is your best song i was like it's edgy it's weird you're trying all these ideas out some things are kind of clipping but in a cool way and 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 i i relate though because i went through the same process where i started to get really good at what i did and i started to understand how i could make things smoother and less edgy but the mm -hmm. problem is, is my music became smoother and less edgy and i think it's part of the thing we do isn't it where we get good at our craft and then we start applying that more than we do the creativity suddenly you start obsessing about everything being even and perfect you know yeah. like soothe is the best plugin in the world i love soothe too it is amazing go out buy it it's incredible but don't use it on everything or, you, or your music's going to sound like ah oh, right. hi everybody it's so nice and the big thing with the, the the film music and trailer music and all these things that were in the biggest part of our music generation considered you know pure and clean and beautiful sounding um there was a lot of focus of not making that too rock and roll and i never agreed with that but i also came through a background where more is better and clean and perfection is gorgeous and stuff but you have to re-engineer the way you think I and mean, you got to learn both ways you know compression is awesome and distortion is awesome and clean is awesome and size is awesome and these these mammoth beautiful lush tones are awesome and you know, I think it was one of my best friends, uh, Scott Reinwan, who you met the other week too, yep. who's VP over at Warner Chapel, and Pat Weaver. They're doing something specific where they're, they're able to create a modern sound for these elements that are kind of traditional. It's not just trailer, it could be underscores stuff, but to be able to know what is too much is a talent. Like what we're saying is, Sometimes edge is really good. I talked to you about that when I'm trying to figure out converters, when we're mixing mm -hmm. a trailer piece that's so extreme that sometimes edge is really good, but it's got to be the right distortion. It's got to be, if it, and it's even okay if it's not like third harmonic or beautiful distortion. It could be harsh because creating that tension that you get from the annoyance of that, ooh, that's aggressive sounding, is actually good for certain types of music, because it's cueing your body to feel an emotion. So going back to uh, some of the people that are dealing with um, the, the admin universe, the head of like content coming in, they're allowing certain things that wouldn't be allowed you know, five years ago because it wouldn't be cool or it wouldn't be right traditionally. And I think the rules have been totally gone into circle where it's just an open playing field and you should I try to push it. And I, I believe Pensado saying that was absolutely Dave. I know you're watching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I, I agree entirely. It's something I've been preaching for years. I mean, it, it, to me, if you listen to kind of blue and you listen to the dams first record, or you listen to raw power by the stooges, they all share that edge. I don't care what anybody wants to say. When I listen to Kind of Blue, yeah, it's a beautiful record. You could put it on in the background when you're having dinner, but it's also, you feel it. You feel that there's an energy in the room. And it's, I know when Al, you know, mixed it for um, Atmos, I got to hear it uh, with Steve Jenowick. And I remember as well. And I remember sitting there and for the first time going, that ribbon mic's distorting on the sax. I've had this record for freaking 30 years and I've never noticed it. And and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, it's like, yeah, we, they went and they bought like a, 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 the oldest vinyl, original vinyl copy they could find. Transferred it for a listen. Well, just to, just to make sure, because they heard it as well. They're like, maybe mm. that happened in the transfer or something like that. So they went out and bought like a original, like 1960 or whatever it was vinyl and got to that place in the song and they hear on the ribbon. And it's just like, I never noticed it. It never made a difference. It never was important to me until I got like my engineer ears. Now suddenly I can be like, oh, I think the three K is a little older, blah, blah, blah. You know, I use raw power all the time. I actually did an interview with Dave and talked about that about seven years ago. And I, that was one of the things I talked about raw power. When search and destroy comes in, 
and the starts and the guitar solo at the beginning comes on it's literally 6 db too loud not <laughs> a little bit too loud like yeah. the whole band just kind of ducks to nothing I was, listening, I was listening to and it's amazing it's exciting uh the righteous brothers you lost that loving feeling the the master that was on the radio for the biggest radio song of all time the other day and at the end you can hear the engineer ducking the fader and then bringing it back up like he's trying to create emotion but it's like 4d it's so <laughs> obvious and you're like what is he doing so i go and i listen to the record version and then i go on my itunes and check it and it's on all of them <laughs> it's the same thing as there's a beach boy song that does the same thing so i'm wondering if it's the same engineer that thought that was creative <laughs> but like all these artifacts and problems are beautiful but i think the key as a producer or engineer or any of these guys is you have to know when it's talent versus sure. a problem i agree because as you know sometimes letting a microphone fall over in the room is totally okay nice comment from ryan he said every time i uh watch established composers talk about what they're doing i get super inspired in capitals well thank you ryan thanks that's very ryan. that's a very nice thing to say oh. Thank you um, so much. Ember wants to know, Brian, um, do you do you prefer writing a DAW or do you uh, do you write in notation software? <laughs> oh, I usually don't write in notation software. If I write notes, if that's the way I'm composing, mm -hmm. which does happen, I I, I just do pen and pencil and paper because I like I like the tact. I, I grew up with the tactile feel of pencil and paper, so. If I'm going to do it, that's if I'm going to write in notation, that's what I'm going to do. Amazing. But usually I'm good. Just playing into the DAW, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. Um, Sheila wants to know where a cup of coffee is, yeah. Eric. Um, <laughs> Get back now. I'm looking here for more questions. Um, I wanted to say something on what you said, please. Mark, about I, I want to just kind of tell you that your approach to reverbs has reinforced, if not influenced, how I think about some of the orchestration and writing decisions, because I think something that I love about Mark's mixes is that he will use reverbs very purposefully to create contrast. Mm -hmm. He won't put like just a giant reverb to wash over the whole thing, because while that may create a sense of unity for some people, I think for me and for a lot of the music that we've worked on, that's the wrong answer because there's too many different colors in the music that need to have their own space. And the way that he goes about creating space for those elements is very much related to reverb color selection and texture. It's not so much EQ because I think you're, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're letting the reverb colors do some of that work. Yeah, I, I don't, I think it's a mistake. I don't know if I'm purposely doing it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think honestly it's Eric? reverb's weird I, I tend to Eric. just try to figure out ways to I know I it sounds really generic it. but it always goes back to what my friend Ryan always says which is music's supposed to Take be fun yeah. so every time yeah. we try to do any kind of change or adding a reverb or something i base it off of something that reminds me of so it always That's references some album or movie or something but the reverb i love reverb which is weird because i like i like more records that are dead and punchy mm -hmm. than i do reverb records but reverb is like such a challenge to get right and oh it is yeah. i was mm -hmm. using the d verb the other day over every reverb I have in my Devo template. plates are still my favorite plate. The, the non-lin non is so good. It's fantastic, yeah. You're going to hear Atticus gobble this up. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to relate it to the idea about that Budapest film or that um, Zelensky movie that we did the video about because you brought up the Igloo Tiny Room and the Budapest Big Room. And that decision is totally based on what the room is sound like, what the reverb is going to do to the strings that is going to draw the, the viewers into the film or expand their awareness to a larger story arc. Donate um, to UNICEF. <laughs> please. Uh, and thank you very much for those of you who have. That, that warms my heart. 
So here's here's a question. I was, I was waiting to see when this would come up. It says, do you think orchestral plugins are advanced enough to be used <laughs> for scoring online, or is it still better to write score AW, DAW and then have it played by a live orchestra? Well, the answer is. Are you saying? Wait. It, it, I mean, they basically say maybe can, can, maybe you can correct this question. Are right. you saying can you write? orchestra in a synth environment and then have it transposed for an orchestra without doing any orchestration? Or are you saying, no, they you take the sample and put it on the TV? They're saying you, using samples over, he, he's asking whether- Yes you, to both. Yeah? Yeah, what do, you, what do you think, Brian? I, I, th I think the answer is yes, you can absolutely use the samples and put them directly in films. All right, I'm gonna throw you under the bus. How often do you do that? Um, Zelensky Zelensky yourself movie pushed under it. the bus. I. <laughs> the what, what was your comment? The Zelensky movie has fake brass. Totally fake brass. And um, it sounds killer. I will tell you a story uh, that just recently happened. I were I did a album trailer music for Warner Chapel that is not released yet, but a very well known mixer I worked with called named Greg Townley uh, tracked and mixed it, and we worked we worked closely together on it. And Mark wasn't available. One of the <laughs> I think wasn't so. available. I don't think he was. Just... But one of the um, one of the most interesting moments was I had you know uh, chosen Greg or wanted to use Greg because he had mixed a trailer album that was almost exactly like what we were going to do, and it turns out all of those sounds were totally samples. All of the solo string sa sounds on this one album were that I liked that I modeled, wanted him to model my mix after were samples. And I had taken the time to, to cut all of the solo strings in my studio and edit them to replace the samples that were in the mockups. But this is something Alan Meyerson said a while ago, years and years ago, which is we've come into an era that, don't quote me on this, because I don't know <laughs> the word for word, but he yeah. said something in the vein of, and this is how I interpreted it, was, We've come into a world where our ears are becoming used to hearing samples and without it, it sounds a little weird. So that's why you're seeing a lot of large movies that are full real orchestras with fake stuff underneath it because what it does is it's almost like auto-tune. Just because you use Melodyne on a vocal doesn't mean the girl or guy can't sing. Right. It just means that it's creating a soundscape that our ears are being very tuned to. If we listen to classic albums, Beatles, Cream, any band that was a terrible singer but just had amazing vibe, I don't think our mind clicks into the same way that if we listen to a new album that the person is just a little off here and there. Now again, it takes the producer or the executive to make the decision if it's a good take or not, if they're out. And sometimes it's perfect that they're out. But I do know that like perfect voices or voices that are in a, a threshold area, that just like strings or fake other things, without adding that in, you miss something and it almost becomes old sounding. Yeah, it can lean, it can just sound too traditional. Now I'm too, not against old. sounding old, I love it. Yeah, but exactly. I know that we're in a generation where we have to evolve into other things and be creative right. and it's okay to distort a violin. It's okay Absolutely. to add a fake violin with the real violin if it's gonna work. So you have to be creative there because honestly, we're in a music conundrum that there's nothing a very optimistic at looking at things of going, that's gonna be very new or fresh genre or something. We're kind of there. So you have to be creative enough to be able to influence off of a melody from something else that reminds you, because that's all it's about, is the emotional connection. Absolutely. Um, Marcos is asking, um, Brian, can you recommend a university to study film composing or something related like that? Well, if you can get into USC, USC is still the maybe the, the top program. I'm not totally sure. Right. Uh, but I have some friends that, that went to UCLA and have done very well, obviously Berkeley, obviously. But if you want film specific composing stuff, right. I would I would probably stick to the LA schools, uh, because the I, I've just seen it. I didn't, I didn't go to USC, but uh, right. But where I, did you go? I went to Pepperdine and Pepperdine. Arizona State. 
Right. But I think the networking that I see that comes out of people who went to USC as, as undergraduates or as a, I think they have a graduate program too, and UCLA mm -hmm. has a graduate program in film scoring. The networking that comes out of there is irreplaceable. Like it's, it's very hard to beat uh, uh, going that route. Yeah. That's, that, that's and as, just advice. like as engineering universe, you, you still need to go. You know, a lot of people are saying, don't go to engineering school. I think it's healthy to go. You don't have to take advanced courses. I think it's important to start shadowing and yeah. understanding who your guy is, meaning you're going to learn from. But I do believe you should go in because the environment of being around other students and learning and inspiring yourself is so much more important than going and sitting in a room by yourself with one guy that might be doing big records. Do that, but you have to experience the other side as well, mm -hmm. which is honestly the competitive side of education. I remember being in the engineering universe as a student, and I was a horrible student. Barely made it through recording school. And I felt like it's just because of the way I learned. I just could not focus. I wanted to make records, but you couldn't. We had to go through testing and stuff. And I kind of regret not putting more attention to that because it took me a lot longer to understand what compression really was. Like really, because I was rushing to just try to get the sound versus understanding what ratio is and stuff. I mean, it took me three years to understand that stuff, even way into it. So I think it's education is absolutely I, Yeah, I think education as a whole, in all shapes and forms, is uh, is important. When people ask me the question, I can't talk about composition. I mean, I, I write, I write songs and stuff, but I can't talk about orchestration and definitely film scoring. But from an engineering perspective, when people ask me that question, I always just immediately go back to them and say, do you like school? And if they're like, oh, yeah, I love the environment, I love it, I'm like, then go to school. But if somebody comes back to me, and go, oh, I hate it. It's too rigid. And I'm like, then don't go. Yeah. Go and intern with somebody. I think yeah. it's more, isn't it? But that's easy for us to say as engineers. I think for film composition, I don't know. Well, I think you should just go go to a school that is less. Go to like a Blackbird Academy. Don't you don't have to go. And I'm not trying to plug anything here, even though right. go to Blackbird Academy. Call Mark Rubel. <laughs> we the all point love Mark Rubel. Who doesn't love Mark Rubel? Johnny and Mark, my friends, the kings of education when it comes Mark to Mark Rubel stuff. is second to none. But it has to do with the idea that we're not talking like go to a four-year school and become a recording engineer. That seems insane yeah. these days. Yeah. Same as, I'm not going to name any other school. Well, it's a bit but, like, I'm, 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 Berkeley is probably one of the greatest music schools in the whole world. Yeah. So I am not going to be negative about it, but Mark will agree with me. I can name you... 10 top session players now that went to Berkeley. Yeah. And all 10 of them didn't actually graduate. Yeah. Because they all found gigs. They went for one or two years. Yeah. And then they find a gig and that's it. But it's all part of the process. They may not have got that gig unless they went there. So uh, it's not saying don't go there. But this you know, is going to cross into a lot of schnizzle. Same thing as <laughs> what Brian is saying about. Um, shadowing a composer yeah. stuff is you need to understand your education, understand what's happening before you get to that internship. Because at least know enough to feel like, okay, I know where this is going. Yeah. Then for me, I learned more than anything in an internship position of, as a runner than I would have ever learned as a technical assistant. So by the time I graduated the internship, which is just, hey, can you make it tonight as an assistant? That was my graduation. Sure. And then I got thrown into that universe. My personality changed from, I knew everything. I was super, still know everything. <laughs> I was 19 years old. I was really cocky. I was really confident. And I was kicked in the nether regions really quickly that say, you don't know everything. I started working at a really large studio in Chicago at the time. It was probably the biggest pre-village, pre all these other studios. This was like the, the country's like multi-room studio. And there was a system there. And I remember the first day I started, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be working on the Neve and stuff like within two months. It was insane. You're going to be producing the yeah. new record by... Uh, Absolutely yeah. called out. And the first two months of being a runner and just observing and a third engineer is what we were called, which was 
at least nice enough to be called that. Yeah. Um, I always give but, the, I always give the assistants. Um, people used to get upset with me. Uh, Dave Dave Jordan was fine about it, but Brian Colstrom would always get annoyed because when we, I did two or three records um, as a musician, yeah. and uh, and co-producer actually on the last couple, and um, I'd always put the assistant engineer as second engineer. And Brian would always get upset. It's like, he didn't engineer. I was like, dude, the guy was here two hours before us, two hours after us, plugged everything in. You know what I mean? My and, philosophy and, of that. And edited Pro Tools sessions and stuff. My philosophy of that is if anyone works on any of my projects, they can put any credit they want on my project. I don't care. I'll leave it up to them. I know that's not a way to do it, but I've, I've gone through so many problems in the past with doing stuff that I've, absolution been credited on way harder we've all been there that at this point in my life that if anyone helps me they're going to get anything they want because it's all about returning any kind of movement but going back to that was going back to the learning your values psychologically you have to learn the psychological way of being in a room with talent so this mm -hmm. is before you learn from a composer or warren or somebody like that you have to know how to like your P's and Q's, which is gonna be obviously another one of these long discussions about learning how to be a shadow assistant or something. But yeah, my education's all, huge. Mine was first. all screwed up because because I, I, I came in the home world. As a player too. Yeah, and as a musician and having two sets of brothers in the village I grew up in that had a studio together and then I kind of came in and, and a couple of those brothers were really successful as musicians and and then we had BBC engineers working in there part time, so we had more gear than we knew, understood, or knew what to do with. So I was learning really random, but I always—I don't know what it is—but I always understood the, um, how to be in the right place. I don't mean like uh, right place, at the right time. I yeah. mean that understood my place. And then when I moved here and met Jack, like you met Ken, I met Jack Douglas, which I'm still in envy of. <laughs> oh man. But when I Magic. met him, it, it, it was easy to work with him because I, for some reason, I had learned to be humble around him. As loud mouthed as they I am They want you to here. be buddies, but they want you to know your place. Yeah. And that is, as a composer, it's even more stressful than um, as an engineer assistant. As a composer assistant, he's basically doing what Eric's doing right now, which is monitor, be in charge of everything. Yeah. Eric everything. is producing this. And then, and then Brian video. will just add his creativity into it and it's a really stressful thing because Eric is the producer and engineer of this video you you want that credit I'll take it we'll put take it, it on it. the underneath <laughs> underneath the video produced and yeah. engineered by Eric von Derrickson we have a we have a we have a a, a nickname policy here where the nickname has to make no sense because, you know, when you're a kid and you get a nickname, it's always derogatory. You know, you have glasses, you were yeah. four eyes, you were overweight, they call you whatever. You know, um, so we, our nicknames make no sense. So he's just Derek. Because he's Eric. just Erock. Erock. Anything, but there's no... Actually, there's a bit of a story, but I can't really tell it. <laughs> Let's just say there was a son of a very, very famous artist rehearsing in my old studio. And he comes bursting into our control room and started demanding that we had to stop while we were recording and sort out his PA settings. I won't say who this guy is, but, you, but you'll probably figure it out. And he said to my engineer, whose name was Robin, he's like, what's your name? And Robin goes, Robin. He's like, Robert? He's like, no. And he's, Robin's very polite in English. He's like, no, 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 it's, it's Robin. Whatever. And so that became like the joke. We'd always call each other by nicknames that were kind of your name. My name is Marv. Yeah, you'd be Marv, <laughs> you'd be Ryan, and I'm Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne. Wyatt. <laughs> Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like the illogical, but it's, uh, it was pretty funny. So I always thought that was kind of a silly story. And then we went over to see Stephen's, uh, Tyler's, Mia's daughter, and she bought the house off this person. And I told her the story, and she's like, oh, yeah, he's such an asshole, that kid. <laughs> it's just insane, the ego. I, that Just going into going it. Going back it's to like, ego stories. We just want to Humble fun. yourself. Just Humble yourself. Just want to have fun. Just have fun. And, like, the compositional side of things, it's probably more stressful and painful than as an engineer. Like, if I lose a gig at mixing a project, it's it sucks, but it's not the end of the world. I mean... You could literally, as a composer, have your life change on one project massively. 
Yeah. And yeah. like if you start something and then they switch gears or, you know, the director is your good friend and he promises you it. And then somehow the EP comes in and says, we're going to use this composer because he's more popular right now. Whatever it is. Which has happened. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about earlier. My experience, what, I yeah. mean, yeah. Yeah. Scored a whole TV show to have it taken away from me like a week before. It Forces you can't up. control. Nothing you can do. Yeah. You have no control over Because they were going to lose that composer if they didn't give him the gig instead. Yeah. yeah. Schnizzle happens. It does. And yeah. that's part of, that goes back to just be a self-starter. Be self-motivated. Find your own reasons and find your own fire for doing what you're doing. That way you won't run out of ideas. You won't, you won't stop writing. Um, and don't feel bad if you need to take a break and need to take a month or two, or whatever. I when actually the, I think the summer, right before I got the Family Guy job, I had I had uh, kind of burned myself out, and I took like three months and just decided. Yeah, you're almost wrapping it up. Yeah, I was like, I'm not gonna. I'm only gonna teach piano. That's what I was doing at the time to make make money, and uh, I just quit trying to pursue writing, producing, whatever I was pursuing at the time. And uh, pretty soon after that, I got a good opportunity. But so if you need a break, take a break. That's the moral. <laughs> so it's the, the, great. And I, I, uh, Brian, I want you, I, I need, I want need to ask you a hundred more questions, but I'm going to quickly fire this over to Mark. So I don't know what this is, but Sonny is asking about the UF8 because Mark has become the de facto authority of the controller. So what can you tell us about what is the that, UF8? The, the fader pack? Is it the fader pack? I don't know. Oh, the SSL a fader? Yeah, it must be the SSL one. What, it, what do you want to know? It just says... Um, I love it. You love it. Can, can, what I do you, don't have what my do you D love command anymore. What do you love about it? Uh, there's multiple reasons. but So I had a D command for years because it was very sensitive as an automated box. And most people know that I'm a sucker for automation because it creates a lot of the personal touch to a mix more than gear. So Great. I wanted to find something that was good. Now, obviously, Avid has the S1, which is really good. But the reason why I like, I like the aesthetics of the UF8 a lot. I like the colors. I like the feel of it. It's incredibly well made. But being a Huey device at first turned me off because Huey devices have kind of a problem at being able to be as large of a pull, push, pull feeling. But this that is such an old technology. It's kind of worrying, isn't it? But you it, always think it's like 20 plus years ago. You're like, okay. But apparently it's like a thousand times more than it used to be now. Uh, okay, so okay, they got okay. that fixed and they know. really did. And then I did a test when they first sent me it against the, the D command. I had an old D command that I can't believe I got any money for it by the time it was going. But the biggest thing was portability because as a mixer, you have to be creative, just like you're a, you're a producer or composer. So sometimes staying in your room can be absolutely creative crushing. So being able to move around, if you can literally take your laptop or your computer and headphones, which if you learn how to do, you can totally do. So being able to take the UFA with me anywhere I need to go and still have my studio and do what I do which is automation, then it's huge. I don't do a lot of automation for correction. I do it for the movement. Yeah. Right, right. So as far as why, I don't know. I like the fact that on top of other controllers, it allows you to do massive presets and stuff. So I have everything in my presets and everything where I can toggle with my center can just be my keyboard, my mouse, and then the fader versus it being, you know, I got a little too, went from having this, of uh, being able to touch everything to having a keyboard and a mouse. And then for a few years only doing that, it was good, but I was limiting myself for not having the movement of the, of the controller. So Sonny uh, followed up on his question says, um, curious how Mark programs his soft keys. On the UFA, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, send me an email, I'll send you my setup. There you go, email him. Uh, there'll be a link underneath. I'm if sure you have it. Is. Yeah. Um, um, a question for you, Brian. Randy says, 
what what do you think is a good starter sample library for composing? You said I recently purchased Albion One by Spitfire. Yeah, Albion One, all the Albion stuff is pretty useful. I mean, a lot of it is fairly large sounding, so it's like kind of a lot of it is geared toward larger sounding epic. huge cinematic kind of yeah i mean i've recently i know it's expensive it's probably not a starter library so never mind <laughs> but i was just going to plug the bur the uh, orchestral tools stuff because oh bring I up the that. piano that we used on i really liked that 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 grand piano you had on that oh. Zelinsky movie what was that keyscape no that is something called I think the company's Imperfect Samples. Oh man! And it's a it's the Walnut Steinway, which that I like is a lot. amazing. Yeah. Imperfect Samples. I'm gonna look that up. That's one of the best sounding software pianos I've ever it heard. It really is. That's a really great. And I am a sucker but, but, for that. But back to that guy's question. I feel bad. I didn't ask. I didn't actually no, no, say no, anything. Okay. But uh, like, I, I I would I would look at cin the cinematic studio strings, the cinematic studio brass. Those are pretty affordable and they are excellent. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, oh, also, good grief, the, um, the, the Hollywood, what is it called? Hollywood Strings? East West? East West. Yeah, those are fantastic. Yeah, you can subscribe to those for like 15 or 20 bucks a month and you get everything. That yeah. is probably the best deal out there. We, we did a, a whole video yeah. with Steve. He came in for a day and wrote and recorded a song from scratch using only East West samples, everything, like bass guitars, electric guitars, pianos, strings, choirs, everything. We did it in a day, didn't we? And it it was crazy how good it was. It's crazy good. I mean, Sean yeah. Murphy engineered the strings and brass, and mm -hmm. it just doesn't get any better. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. He is the best. Um, there was there was a question here, and I think it just it goes back a little bit. Um, in a competitive world, I'll rephrase it, but I know what they're trying to ask. In a competitive world that you live in with composition and stuff. Do you find that you're when somebody is emailing you and saying, hey, I'm interested in you trying out or doing something for this, blah, blah, blah. Is it that competitive? You feel like you just keep it close to your chest? I think I think people are trying to understand what it would be like, like living and working in Los Angeles where the work's coming through. I mean, is it that competitive of, of an industry where you're like, I'm going to get my <laughs> get my get my uh, my cue in, see if they like it. I'm not going to be like, cool. hey, buddy, have you heard about this new uh, thing? If you know the right supervisor or Brian has a partnership with his buddy Dan, yeah, it's good. But if, if you're going cold, I mean, I almost, at the beginning of the pandemic, I almost took a leadership director's job of basically what you're explaining where people are pitching. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had to go through 60 or 70 emails every pitch deck. And... I couldn't manage it. It was just like the idea of all these people that we're in an industry now where you could be seconds away from making a great amount of money on a Q piece, so you're going to do it for free. It used to be used to get a demo fee yep. and all these options. You get a kill fee. Yeah. You get and now I... it's like if you're a supervisor pulling from a library, you're also having people pitch to you. And just because you're a supervisor doesn't mean there's other supervisors working on the same trailer so yeah you keep it close to your chest is what he was asking are you saying i guess i'm not sure what the, what he's asking are, are, are i think he's probably trying to get an understanding of the competitiveness of living in los angeles and working oh you know, well stuff you know i mean yeah it's extraordinarily competitive i yeah. mean I, I I guess I'm wondering if he's asking if do I tell other composers about opportunities? Is that kind Basically, of what? Basically, yeah. Yeah. No, it depends. Keep it close. You, you just keep... Okay. It well, it depends on yes and no. If you I don't, mean, if you can't take it, you, of course you're going to tell people about it. Yeah, I'm just going to be real honest. And if I want it, and and I value it, yeah, I'll probably keep it fairly close. If I'm in a camp of people, like I have a camp of people, we all do that we yeah. trust. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm happy to share information with people in my camp or so you you definitely end up forming these circles of trust uh because the part of the part of the reason for that is you don't want to recommend something or let something go somewhere that you can't v vouch for because ultimately some of that comes back to you not you know no one's really gonna you know tank your reputation if you recommended something and it didn't work out usually but I think I think this industry is very, very much about trying to establish trust. And 
that goes back to like a place like USC or UCLA, where that will give you the opportunity to establish trust with people that will be able to help you capitalize on that. Um, because sitting in your room writing music, as you all know, and I well know, doesn't establish trust with anyone. <laughs> I agree. Uh, so, yeah, long, I mean, long I, I, I like a, a few a few years ago, I, w I had some, uh, I was in business with somebody and they, um, they trusted um, somebody who eventually, um, I wouldn't say ripped them off, but eventually, you know, um, you know, took the work away from them. And they told me about it. And, and we've all had this experience every single, mo probably multiple times. And I, and, and my response was, I think you did the right thing. They're like, oh, you know, I should have done this. I should contract and this, that. And I was like, yeah, but you want to work with people that you can do that with. Yeah. yeah I want to say to Mark, Mark, I'm really, really busy. Can you mix this thing for me? And he mixes it. Neil I did it with Neil Avram. We were doing the Aerosmith record and it was going over time, over time, over time, over time. We had a delivery date. So I called up Neil Avron, um, his good friend. We have the same manager and said, would you start mixing the record? And we would track till 10 o'clock at night and then drive to Paramount and sit with him for like two or three hours and tweak the mixes. And the minute that I finished the album, he's like, OK, buddy, back over to you. And then I mix the other half. Right. That's what you want. You know what That's I mean? What you don't want, I'm going to take the album. You know what I mean? That's correct. You want to have camps of people. That yeah, the naivety, yeah. I think, is good. Yeah. And if, 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 and if you find people that don't, aren't reciprocate, don't reciprocate and, and are not trying to look after each other, that's okay. They're, that's it. They're gone. That's okay. <laughs> and, and that. Spiritually, but, there's a component to this as well yeah. that my wife is very good at reminding me about, which is if it didn't come to you, it wasn't meant for you. Right. And that's hard to live with sometimes, it is. to be perfectly honest. But over time, you see you always reflect that that is true. In a couple of years. <laughs> it it's does. almost like the girlfriend. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'll give you an idea of why you should always make sure that you're wearing your best shirt. Right. Is, we did a session at East West five years ago or something like that. My assistant then, David, who's this great guy, um, he was just great. I used him a handful of times of sessions. And I had a call from Adam asking about doing, uh, for EA Sports, doing some vocals on something. And I didn't, couldn't and didn't want to do it because um, I like the whole remix now. I don't even like to record anything. Um, but I, his, his name came up when we were talking mm -hmm. and I said, I got to get off the phone. I'm going to call David. Cause I remembered how great of a guy he was. And I, you know, I talked with him a couple times in the last five years, but I just remember how much of a cool guy he was. And I knew he had a production room that could do these vocals. So call David up. He was available instantly, got the gig, did it case closed. But the point is always, always leave. Cause you never know long-term if that person's going to remember you and you come up. Yeah. It took five yeah. years for me to call up David and say, I had this gig. But honestly, he'll probably get called again and again by that contractor yeah. for doing the work, just because of that. I, I talk, uh, I've got loads of experiences the same way, I agree. Uh, Andrew Wells is a very, very successful producer now. He's still, what, was he 27? And about, he was 16 and he emailed me and said, hey, I've got a band with my friends and I'd really like you to mix the song. So I, I said what I always say, send me an MP3. You know, I don't even talk money or price or anything. I want to hear what I'm mixing. So they send you the MP3 and it was, sounded pretty well recorded. And that was actually kind of a cool song. It was, it was very reminiscent of the music I liked, late seventies, early eighties, kind of a little kind of post-punky and Joy Division-y stuff. And I was like, oh, this is cool. So he, he, he then emailed back and said, well, how much? I gave him my indie rate, he said, no problem. And then he said, can I attend? And I was like, only on the recalls. Let me mix it. I'll send it to you. And then you can come and sit with me for like two or three hours. And we'll do the recalls together. And then we're done. So he showed up. He sat with me. He asked me like two minor questions. Like, oh, wow, I really like what you did. The kick, how'd you do it? Oh, yeah, you know, I said a couple of things. What I did. did you do? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a couple of things like that. And I really liked his guitar playing. And then about six months later, I, I was, uh, I, I was, uh, um, um, uh, a and R ring at uh, Capital, and the oh, what's his name? Not Troy Savan, um, the Australian singer. Anyway, this kid's this kid singer. They needed a new guitar player, 
And the, the kid was only 16 or 17. And I was like, I've got the perfect guy. You know, because the way he interacted with me, this guitar playing was great. You knew that he knew how to respect. And so I said, get this guy. He comes down, he auditions, he gets the gig. Then like a year or two later, label call me up again. New signing. No, we not only do we need a teenage guitar player that's good, we need a musical director in that age group because this kid will not deal with, you know, a 45-year-old guy like myself. It's got to be somebody that can... And I said, well, you forgot about Andrew Wells. I'm like, oh, yeah, that kid. They get him back in. The lesson is, is like, he didn't send me the email like, you need to do this and you have to do this. And, you know, which is 90% of the emails I get. Um, he just was super humble. He paid for his time to come in and interact and learn. And I've had lots of those experiences, you know, and, and it's just a... I understand, you know, when so many people here are sitting at home, I see, I, I feel people's frustration. You know, they're sitting there and they're writing and recording great music. And sometimes it's really, really great. Unfortunately, there's more to it. It's that ability to be, I love this phrase, a worker amongst workers. I think you just said something uh, that is brilliant and I've done it and I want to point it out, which is hire somebody for their time. Spend right. an hour or two, just pay someone, pay what what's the going rate for like AAA engineer guys? I don't know, two hundred dollars an hour, five hundred dollars an hour. No, it's just you know, it's not that much anymore. Pay, I mean, pay. We're them. Trying to downgrade our, our our prices, but no, you can get yeah. <laughs> guys for a lot less. Well, thirty pay, bucks an hour. I've paid musicians <laughs> to come into my studio just to play for a while to show me their instruments. Right. Show me yeah. what they're doing. Show me what I can learn. Show me what I can do with what they've got. Yeah. And you will learn way more than you think you will by, yep. by hiring somebody that you admire for whatever the whatever yep. the hour or two costs. It's the reason why you, you go out and hire the best session players you can because they come in and they've done a hundred sessions with every major producer and engineer in the world who's beaten them up to pieces and they yep. come in and play the right thing almost immediately. Yep. You're buying all that acquired knowledge. That's right. And then you hear often I'm like you know, maybe I have a vision. I come in, I know exactly what I want. But sometimes I come in, I'm a little lost on this song. But I know, I know a couple of guys that will really figure out what the groove should be. You hire the great drummer, the great bass player. They know the groove. You learn something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And mix it up. Yeah. You get in patterns where you use the same team. Yeah. So what he was saying earlier, which is have your orbit, basically. So you, I can in my head, I have a Rolodex of three types of drummers for each kind of music. And obviously there's two reasons for that. One is, if this guy's not available, you have this guy as your backup. But the other one is, this guy, my personality work better with this artist versus that, in the sense where he's a little more easygoing, or this guy's a little quieter, where the artist has a little more of a, ego's wrong word, but more of a, he, he needs to dominate the room, so you don't want the personality of the drummer to overtake. All these things you have to remember to consider when well, you're putting those things in there. And and spinning off of that, I've, I've also, you know, learned over the years that something you can do is try to hire, if you're putting together a band, try to hire a, an anchor player that you know has kind of the dominant energy in the room and then ask that guy who he wants to play with because you, you will likely put together a higher end group that plays well together by trying to lean into the energies that are, of guys that like to play together. It's worked to my advantage many times over the years to do that. And uh, you also end up getting maybe some guys you couldn't have gotten otherwise. And that that's always really, really fun. Yeah, I, Brian Kallstrom, as an engineer, said to me, um, he said, I, bearing in mind, he started late 80s, early 90s, and he did Dirt, which I remember him telling me when he did Dirt, he laid awake but for months after it was finished, thinking that it was the worst thing he'd ever did. And then, of course, it went on to become a classic album. It's Alice in Chains, Dirt. And um, he said to me, he goes, I became a better engineer when I walked into a studio with better equipment. And it's not, I'm not saying go out and spend millions of dollars of equipment. It's just a realization. Whatever you work with, that's how much better you get. And I remember when I first took my neighbor, when I first heard, hired Dan Rothschild, I had like a $2,000 budget. I owned my studio, but I had a $2,000 budget to do a song. He was $1,000 a day. So I got in like um, Johnny Hara on drums, my old drummer. I gave him a hundred bucks. I played guitar, you know, and so we ended up with, you know, $900 of profit for like five days work. But Dan Rothschild came in and played the freaking best, grooviest bass line I've ever heard. And he said to me, oh, Johnny's great. Hey, you should meet my other guy. 
And before you know it, I had a number of another drummer. Yeah. And then that drummer came down with Dan. And Dan's like, oh, you know, because you're on the other side of the glass, I, I recommend this guitar player should come in. And boom, suddenly I'm like Greg Saran and Tim Pierce. And before you know it, I know all of the best L.A. players. That's what I'm talking about. And I got yeah. better because I had better musicians. That's and I right. learned well, from them and they learned from me and blah, 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 blah. Here's the, the big thing to take away from it because this approach is very similar. I must quickly as, say, you can do that remotely. <laughs> as you can, you can as the difference between remotely. composers okay. and engineers, this, this is the same topic, which is you start, you, you become better the better the projects, but you don't want to jump too fast. So I was getting really hungry to work with larger, better talents when I was younger, obviously, because you get sick of working with the crappier bands. But what that did was it made me, it's like learning guitar on a shitty acoustic guitar. Yeah. You know, your, your hands learn way different. By the time you pick up a guitar that's really set up well and stuff, you're flying. So if you're composing on a crappy indie film, you keep doing that for five years. By the time you get called and you're ready for the big film, you're going to be super ready versus you might have the talent to do the big film in the beginning, but yeah. you might not be ready for it. And that's the same as engineering, same as producing, same as anything. And I look back going, okay, my first five, seven years, literally seven years after post assistant world of just kind of managing a studio and producing records was just not great albums and stuff. It's kind of like what you were talking about. But what that did was it made me incredibly ready when it was time to work with the, the, the bands. And it just happened overnight where you start one project, they like you, you get another one. And that's, I do get a lot of those questions about how do you get into working on those projects and it's all timing. All of it's timing, but you have to be ready or you're never gonna get that second call. Yeah, that that's a, I like to talk about having fitness as a composer, because if you stop writing for a few months, you have to restart the engines and it yeah. takes a little time yeah. so you know it's it's good to just keep writing for whatever write library projects write commercials write anything uh write pitches uh but keep your fitness up like mark said you, you if you're not ready and you're and you do get a good opportunity it's going to be tough <laughs> so staying fit is a big big part of it yeah absolutely i'm scouring here for questions people are asking can i ask questions yes <laughs> Ask the question. That's what I'm doing. I'm scouring. Um, uh, this is an interesting one. This is a good question. Um, something I really struggle with right now is where do I find decent content to practice? I want to practice more, but I'm having a hard time finding good material. Well, I mean, produce like a pro. If you join our academy, we have about 80 multi-tracks, maybe even 100. I think, we should be past 100. I think we're past 100 multi-tracks and every genre you can think of. Um, and to be honest, we do a ton of free downloads of which one is by these fine gentlemen over here there is a link underneath and we ask that if you can please donate to unicef that's the only thing we ask for you downloading the free multi-tracks there is also a video that mark did a couple of days ago explaining how he mixed it that's a cool one because it's an actual score piece so you can actually hear what an orchestra sounds like in two different environments and the same as the piano and everything we kind of talked about and blending the synthesized drum or synthesized brass yeah. into Sampled brass the whole yeah. organic feel. And if you look closely, there's a lot of automation on that to create that kind of feel. But maybe I'll do a course just on that or just a video on just that. I think that'd be amazing. Um, how to take synth stuff and make it more realistic. Although I think Brian, Brian created the video for you, your next video. That's mixing with reverb. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he sold you big time on Didn't your I use of reverb. Like four times? <laughs> well, you we might have to do it. I think Brian times. should do a, this is how you set up a compositional. Let's get a vote. <laughs> I Honestly, yeah, yeah, a composition video would be amazing. We should, sure, we could talk about it for sure. Yeah. Let, love let, to. Let's do it. We'll figure out whatever, whatever, whatever is best for you. We'll make it work. Um, so... Ah, right, good. Questions are coming in now, we said. I've been mixing and producing my own for nearly 15 years, but wanted to branch out from mixing. What's a good way to network, put myself out there to hire for these days? I'll give you my quick perspective because I get asked this question a lot. If you're a producer, a guitar player, a bass player, a, a, a singer, a writer, whatever, don't be afraid to do any one of those jobs. 
like a lot of times like you just you you, you said it because you got hired to orchestrate something which was already a song that was written so you're not composing so you're probably for instance you know maybe taking a quartet on a Kobe Calais song and using the main melody and working off of that you know doing already the chords are already laid out for you there's harmonic content that you have to follow etc um so that is a sort of gateway into it if you're a guitar player and you're a producer don't be afraid to play guitar on somebody else's stuff you know to me it's like you just want to make relationships absolutely well one of the biggest things is like and you alluded to this when you were talking about going to the studio for the first time like next week i'm going to be producing my uh, first band because i'm now working at a studio with an ssl or a knee <laughs> The, the point is, is that it doesn't matter how you get in. You could master somebody's track, you could mix it, you could do a guitar overdub, you could write the string arrangement, you could do the piano part, you could, you could edit the vocal, you could comp the vocal, you could do any one of about 5,000 little jobs yes. to just build relationships. It doesn't have to be about one's ego of like, no, if I'm not the producer, I don't want anything to do with it. You know, bang just do whatever you can <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more yeah just do whatever you agree. can to build relationships yeah well i still believe that i mean i think it was bill schnee that said like i own my studio i'm going to take out the trash there's no it, it doesn't matter and I, that was something that really stuck with me i can't remember how he said it but it was basically i don't believe in roles that are only for certain things like this is a community you work in a, a family oriented area where you're a team and i'm going to take the trash out today or something like that yeah. and that, that was really yeah it really stuck with me because i've been in environments as an assistant 20 years ago of the most superficial arrogant intoxicatingly disgusting people that had no sense of anything around them that i mean the things that i had to go through it makes me want to just fade away into an existence and then you meet the people that are literally the kings of what they're doing and they're just like yeah. hold on one second i gotta take jack, this trash out jack, jack pulls up in a pair of cargo shorts yeah and and, and a sweatshirt Smoking a cigar. The cigar is probably more expensive than any of the clothes he's wearing. Yeah. And he always he always rents a wreck. He goes to that rent a wreck place. So he pulls up in like a 1995, you know, Honda or Toyota. Basically because he smokes so many cigars, he probably doesn't want to like ruin the new car. Mm. But no pretension whatsoever. Just kind of comes up and sits down there and I like, get him the New York Times and a cup of coffee and almonds and he's happy. I mean, th those are the people. I remember working with uh, um, Susanna Hoffs in my little studio doing demos for her record and i've told this story many times so people heard it and this truck reversed you know that meep 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 in the middle of a vocal and i and, and we got to the end of the song and i was like sorry about that and she just burst into laughter i was like i think we should probably punch in the bridge and re-sing it so we go in the bridge and re-sing it two days later i've got a local band in there and somebody like honked the horn outside I can't believe this. This is not professional. The guy who's paying me like $15 an hour. She'd sold 17 million records. The other guy who was paying me $15 an hour was like, this is unprofessional. And it's just like, you know, she's Susanna Hoss. She's an incredible person and great yeah. to be around. The other guy, I don't remember his name. Exactly. It just never <laughs> hurts to be a nice person. It never hurts to be a good person. I had the same story and it was at the village and it was when our room up in Studio E, which is the third floor and it's a great studio but it's a very old building and we were doing vocals with some session vocalist and there was some loud booming coming from below i knew who was below me i had no idea what music was ed cherney's room was right below me so all is that and he mixes louder than me or mixed louder than me and he, the singer just kept complaining the whole time. I cannot believe what you call this a studio. I just, I mean, I can't focus. Like, I mean, his ego got in the way and we go downstairs afterwards. And then Probably I come back upstairs, stone, yeah. I get upstairs, I go right into Ed's room. I peek in cause I knew that at the time, if no one's in there, I can come in and just talk with him. So I sat with him. He's mixing some reissue of the stones yeah. and the idea <laughs> of like, <laughs> Just thinking about this kid who probably got up so excited because he's being hired as a vocalist 
but then got distracted as a performer because of what's happening in a community workspace, yeah. which is exactly what yeah. your studio was, which is exactly what the studio in Utah, which was this huge church yeah. that was not isolated in the proper way that you would think it. Same as Abbey Road Studio One, you can hear birds outside. Yeah. I mean, it's just, this is a creative environment. When Things the Sundays did their first record, Sly and Robbie were downstairs, and uh, the Sundays are friends of mine, and, and they said they could hear yeah. just coming through the whole time. But they're like, it's Sly and Robbie. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, it doesn't get any better. Try to work around <laughs> the stuff that doesn't matter. And I, uh... yeah. All right. There's some direct questions. Uh, Brian, um, do you feel there is an ambient guitars library? Ooh. You know an ambient guitars library? I don't think that I know of one specifically i mean i always did my welcome friend ryan make ryan did you make something that did he send you a beta of that last year oh yeah yeah is no, that an ambient thing no, i can't remember exactly what it was but i that brings up a good point i think that this is a really good thing to talk about for people who are trying to what, do what you said just do any job yeah that's a niche like yeah, find yeah. a niche that you can do and sure. put it out there. Create an ambient guitars that's library. Create that's a, a unique re- ambient guitars library. Wait a second. No, don't, don't do, do that. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. It's a terrible idea. When do we start? Mark, yeah. let's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's get... I got about 300 pedals. Let's start doing it now. Yeah. I have an upright piano that I paid like 600 bucks for. And during one time I was, I had like a month where I was just kind of down. Yeah. I spent the whole time sampling, creating effects. I ended up selling it for several thousand dollars. Just because I was bored, I was like, I'll just do this this month or this week I want a or whatever copy. it was. I need, I need. Like it, it, it's full of, you know, you learn a bunch of stuff. It's easy to do if you've got an instrument lying around, create a library. You can Especially also create, you know, your splice right. pack of create a guitar a splice amp pack, right. and then make money off that. You could sell a stinger pack to a production music company yep. that can place in trailers. You can work with a trailer company that just has hits and samples and stuff, but... Hey, Atticus, Philip says hello. Oh, sat up. He's a, he's feeling a little sick today. The car oh. ride got him for some reason, which is weird. I'm not saying you'll make a ton of money if you create a unique ambient guitar library, but you will meet people. I think I you'll agree. meet some people. Yeah. Um, Mark, um, uh, Jade, uh, Jade Sean says, can you talk about what mics you would choose in regards to recording strings? Two mics. Two mics? Always, yeah. Um, I would always try to find, if if I had to rent a pair of either stereo M50s or three for a Deca, those are the most important mics in a room that's big. You know, if you do a, a Deca tree in a smaller midsize room, it doesn't sound very good. I would stick to stereo there, but I would still use tubes like mm-hmm. C12S or 47-esque or 49-esque, but you can rent a pair of really great German tube mics from Blackbird for nickels compared to what it's going to do for your sound, because that's going to be your signature. And I lean mainly on the stereos versus the spot. So even though my spots, if I had the option, it would always be old German mics, tube mics. I know when we were in air a couple of years ago, um, they soloed the Deckers. And I was like, it didn't change much. And they're yeah. like, yeah, it's 90% of the mix. And we're talking about Air Studio, so it's mic on everything. But the Decca tree was basically the sound of the orchestra. And then just a little bleed. And then, oh, the timpani needs to come up in this section. So just take the timpani mic and then bring it back. But that's, that's the thing to think about is there's a lot of older school engineers that feel that you can't put like a microphone very close to a bass or a cello because they're used to it breathing. And I'm like, well, that's what the ambient mic is for Mm. the spot mic is for the spot you're supposed to be able to get the definition so i would always ram a 47 right up to the upright bass and the player would always back up no matter where it was at what session it was they would always back up and i would always have to go out or have the assistant guy go out and say don't move and they would always get defensive and it's like it's supposed to be that close because that's where you get all the low-end definition out of it. All of it. 
And then you use, and I'm not using that aggressively. I'm yeah. just using it when I need the definition. Totally. So I think a lot of people feel like putting spot mics on something close is bad. But I mean, listen to Jeff Emmerich, uh, Eleanor Rigby, mm -hmm. how close he mic'd that quartet. I mean, it's insane at that time, the fact that he probably almost got fired for putting it that close. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just listening to it. It was like that close. And you blend that in with an ambient, it's gorgeous. Hugh Pageant told me that room at Abbey Road, he said, it's not that live. It's not that live. Two or three. Isn't it two? That is two the main one they were doing? Yeah. yeah. He said, it's not that live. In fact, he said he was a little disappointed because they went in there to do a sting kind of choir. Oh, and he said it didn't sound like a huge That's choir. when I, I see orchestras in there. I'm like, really? Yeah. That's that's a weird sounding room for But they keep orchestra. it really dry, yeah. So close miking as well. It must have been super dry. Awesome. Mm. Um, so a couple of... Um, uh, a lot of people saying do the multiple jobs is a great idea. Um, somebody saying ribbons for Decca? Yeah. Um, the reason why M50s work, and a lot of people may know this, but if you don't, they're very specifically unique because the way that they have a mechanical uh, omni capsule. So it's a, the M50 has like a plastic sphere on it. So all the high frequency is cardioid and then everything else slowly goes into an omni. So if you just start putting figure eight ribbons up or omni microphones up, you're getting a lot of the ambient and you're not getting the definition. The reason why M50s or M50 clones or something that does what it's supposed to do like that is really good is because it's getting all the beautiful, bright attack and focus from the cardioid side of it, but the enormous, beautiful ambient of everything below whatever the crossover is on the mechanical thing. So I would say ribbons are great, but I do, I would almost go, if you're gonna do that, put a pair of cardioid 87s or something, 414s as well, to get the edge and the brightness and the air of the do orchestra. You, do you have any rule of thumb, to, just talking about mixing, as to when you know when your mix is ready? No. Lost that? No. <laughs> <laughs> when do you stop mixing, they're being asked? When my head starts pounding. When your head stops pounding? When my cavity falls out. Oh, it's time. Okay. Sheila's asking about re-recording mixes. Is that still a job? She's saying, you know, bearing in mind how much, um, you know, how much technology has moved, moved out. Re-recording mixes. For movies. Like re-recorded oh, mixer? Yeah. Like okay. the job of a re-recording yeah, yeah. re mixer? What is yeah. she asking about it? She's just asking, is, is it a, a, as big a job yeah. as it is relevant? I think so. It's probably yeah. bigger. Yeah, consistent. I, mean, I mean, the content and all the streaming. Are, I mean, yeah, that's a, probably a really good job to get into. Right. Yeah, I, I think it. I not think my world. Is. Way more than music engineer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's probably good. I mean, like most union things, if you can find the yeah. union work, it's very, very good. It's very. They I mean yeah. sound designer, even ADR engineers. Those oh, that, yeah. that that field is very stable. Well, it might not be stable for the old timers to look back going stable, but. Compared to like, if you wanted to get a job as an assistant engineer at a music studio. I mean, that's an interesting point. Like I work in a post, my studio is in a post-production house. And one of the, couple of the engineers there started out in music and then found yeah. uh, like that just working with dialogue and sound effects was very rewarding, rewarding to them. And the work is tons of, tons of work. In yeah. fact, I think they're looking for a, a fully Q person right now, but like, being being willing to try a lot of different jobs because I think you guys as engineers have have a deep, a deeper maybe bench of skills than you sure. realize. You know. Yeah. When you asked me about have I mixed film stuff and I was like, yeah, I have. It's between all of the other things that we do. I've never been yeah. like, oh, it's going to mix film. It's just because you're working with somebody. And you go, oh, we have this other project we have to do. Would you mix that? And it's something other than you know what we're, we're typically here. There's so many great questions here. I'm going to try Look, and the do The challenge some... of mixing film is what pulled me in. Yeah. It's really hard. And then trailer is even harder. <laughs> trailer seems tough. And that's what makes me yeah. just absolutely feel my weight when I can turn in a trailer piece to the proper person that has super high standards, like a Scott or Pat Weaver, or Robert Bennett. Robert, yeah. That just, if you can get them to be like, this is awesome, then you know you're in a good direction. I mean, that's the other thing is, I thrive off of criticism. 
a lot of the time I would not do well in the beginning hearing someone say it's not right because I didn't know how to get it better. Now, right. when someone's like, it's not right, and they're very definite of this isn't right, your frequency here is weird, and it's a, like a no of recalls. Oh, I love that. Versus, it sounds good. Thank you. And then you think something's wrong when they don't give you critiques. <laughs> they just something. resign themselves to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of sort of questions on a theme, which I think I think we've sort of answered, but a lot of like, because we're talking about um, creating your own network. Getting out there, finding other like-minded people, mm -hmm. be willing to be a worker amongst workers. You know, like, what do I need to do to work with you? What do you need done? How can I help? I mean, I've had, I had somebody probably about 20 years ago when I was, you know, engineering and producing and all this kind of stuff and coming up, as it were, you know, I, I say to me um, when I wanted to work with them, they're like, yeah, you're really talented but you're, you're not much used to me. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, I need people that are a third of your price. I need people, just being really blunt with me, yeah. I need people that I can farm like tons of work to that can just chop it up and send it back to me. You're already like composing, writing, producing, doing all this stuff. You're, you're no use to me. I'm, you'll, you'll get frustrated work, you know, with the work kind of work. And I think that um, we have to sort of humble ourselves because one of the biggest things that happened to me, obviously the fray was a big record, for me but actually um, my break came because I was producing and entering a lot of local bands and some were having modicum of success I got a few bands signed and stuff like that but I was already a producer engineer mixer but my manager was Sandy Roberton and Sandy called me up one day and says um, Dave Sardi needs a programmer and my manager didn't understand that a Pro Tools engineer was not a programmer he called Pro Tools engineers programmers so I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, you know, somebody to edit in Pro Tools. And he's, uh, he's about to start this record. He needs somebody like now because the, the other guy's pulled out. So I go and I have lunch with Dave Sarley. And there I am. I'm back to being a Pro Tools editor. And I've been using Pro Tools since about 96, 95. And here it is like 2002 or something. And I'm back being somebody's. But I got to work with the Thrills. I got to work with Jet. I got to work with the Hot Thrills. Hot Heat. Oh, they're great. Yeah, got the gold records up there somewhere up there, isn't it? Well, yeah, that, I mean, I've, I know I've told this same story, but when I started working for Bill Schnee, I think I was seven years into doing what I did, way right. past my assistant level. Yeah. I literally produced an album that Bill mixed. Yeah. Came out here to LA and was with Doug Sachs and Bill, and that's where I met Eric Boulanger when he was like 14. Yeah. He was so young. And I had to reset myself and remember like I have experience, but like the the gratitude of this man giving me any of his time was important to me. So he would, I basically started over. Intern, shadow, whatever you want to call it, it was definitely in that thing, but I, I felt that I was having a little more um, knowledge of how things operated or what, because I knew the specifics of what that microphone is going to sound like and stuff. But I think it's important to know that like every gig you take, you're not going backwards. You're just going to take something out of that and run with it. Right. Here's a, here's, here's some, let's, let's go back to Brian. Uh, Mary and Sam, they're great Academy members and always great questions. What do you feel the differences are between producing and composing for both of you for animation and games versus film composition? Uh, animation and games. I, I'm not sure if they, I guess my experience is much more with animation being come from family guy and American dad. And that's a very sort of traditional world. I think games are a little different. I haven't done many, I haven't done much work in that world, but animation, you know, the world that I came from is sort of a hyper real, hyper sensitive, hyper real reactive way of scoring. Of course, Family Guy being very, yes. <laughs> you know, Seth was all about replicating the, the Hollywood era sound and creating this. Yeah, Seth, Seth wanted to leave Beaver, you know, yeah. animation like he, he wanted very reactive, you know, very uh, old school sounding. 
stuff. Yep. Which okay. is great because when he sings, he sounds like a Sinatra kind of style singer. Oh, no, he, yeah, he's, a, he's, an, he's a, a an amazing talent, yeah. like all, all around. But, um, but f film, especially, you know, in large part these days, they don't want that kind of traditional, unless they explicitly state it, but a lot of things that we watch are much more subtle. The, the the scope and scale of the melodic arcs, if they exist, is much longer, much further back dimensionally from what's happening on the screen. Like we're not reacting to somebody's somebody's eyes widening because they got surprised in film scoring most of the time. Right, you which know? is why, in my opinion, like usually video games, you lean more on fantasy music based like, around that. So. I've done a lot of mixing for Riot. Yeah. Specifically, that's a very fantasy driven story world. Not just their game, but their entire world is like all tied into this fantasy thing. And I believe the mixing side of that is virtually the same as movie mixing. But I would believe that the compositional side of that is very specific to what you're doing. Doesn't it mean if it's a video game, though? I think it would mean can they understand the fantasy correctly now granted i'm sure there's some music people that would tell me that to be able to write the cue moments the spots where like things change in the emotion is probably different in a video game than it would be on a movie though. plus for video quite often you have to write a piece of music that can loop for serious periods of times where obviously in film even TV shows, obviously, you've got like, here's a cue, it's this long, it's got yeah. to convey this emotion, where, yeah, video game stuff can be... Uh, yeah, we're tick, spotting tick, 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 tick. things <laughs> in film and television, you know, to, yeah. to go from here to here and have this arc, and in video games, yeah. I think there is a, maybe a different timeline. So, immersive, it always comes up. Um, so, it's a two-part question for each of you. Um, uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask yours first. Um, are you thinking about getting an Atmos room? Are you going to mix in Atmos or I've... any kind of immersive? I've been well, surround courted. Oh, I've done plenty of surround, yeah. Right. Um, you know, Carrie at Dolby's a great guy. I'm really good pals with John McBride and have spent a lot of time in Studio F listening to that room and understanding it. I don't know if I would do it well. I've been asked a lot when I'm turning in mixes and I actually farm it out to another guy, my stems, so he can put it together. I just don't know if I could do it well. I didn't enjoy mixing surround very much. I still get it here and there, but the immersive thing doesn't resonate with me. I'm not anti, so don't get me wrong. I, I understand the value of it. I just don't know if the way I mix is all based around the dimension of a stereo speaker so front to back in stereo is really difficult and i spent a lot of time understanding the width in the front to back and if i break that out into something else it never glues correctly it just i i don't know how to do it I, i've gone to many atmos rooms and sat with them and toyed around ken clay wants me to come help him on this Joni mitchell catalog in atmos and i'm just like i don't know if I don't know if I can do it. It's not that I'm doubting that I can do it. I just, you know, some people are saying that they don't know how to do it or can do it. Chad Blake once said that he doesn't understand how to do reverb and mixes. That's why all his stuff is dry. So some things just come natural to some people. Oh, when I when I went with Jack, he he'll, he'll, he doesn't want to use reverb at all. To him, it's all delays. Everything's yeah. mixed with delays. Yeah. So I, I think... For him, it's like... Uh, record it with the ambience on it and then i'll add some delays he doesn't understand that doesn't appreciate or really want to use artificial reverbs yeah uh, maybe it's, a plate maybe the echo chamber at the studio but it's just so foreign to me to hear that but that's my take on it so brian mm. same question i have you been asked have you are you thinking about it of oh yeah posing in immersive i can't wait to do it like i, I great I have ideas about what I would want to do, and I think, I think my, my main interest it would be trying to explore how to write differently so that it worked. That's why I do format. cutting you in. I do believe that that will. We should be putting way more attention on putting out like soundscape score albums, 
as albums, soundtrack albums as albums and focus on doing the Atmos presentation through that. Because that's where it's going to shine way more than a pop song. I, I completely agree. I think until we're writing for that format, it's it's going to be fun, but it's going to be a, a bit of a novelty. And I, that's why I'm excited about it, because I, I have some ideas about how what I would like to do with that. And right. I, I can imagine plenty of... But, but do you write for surround? I haven't. Most of the projects that I've... They, they want stems, and then they want the dub mixer or the music mixer to break it out into a surround mix. Interesting. But happens I know lot. that Junkie XL and people like that do write in quad, mm -hmm. like they do work in, in that environment. But Well, he also likes to mix his own stuff. He mixes his own stuff. Yeah. So yeah. that's another dimension to that. Uh, but again, like creatively, I think we have to conceive of that format in order for it to work it, at the writing stage. Right. There's tons of great questions here. My favorite at most recording I've listened to in the proper environment was a Beach Boys track that they added the London Symphony on. That was amazing, yeah. And putting that into a, a surround was way more interesting than well, that starts Rocket to make Man. sense because there's two there's there's a couple of different environments that need to be addressed. Well um, it's also an orchestra that has many moving parts and it's you know that an orchestra is in a room in a circular format. You could literally sit in the format of the orchestra and basically be right next to where Brian Wilson will be singing. Yeah. And that, to me, is way more attractive. Yeah. Or some of these sonic hip-hop projects that are doing these trailerized hip-hop albums, which that would be really cool to hear. Well, anytime you're, yeah, that's a, anytime you're mixing like a, a pop rock format or environment with an orchestral environment, it starts to make sense to need that extra space. Um, but, I, you know, I don't, hear a, I don't hear a lot of that in, in film yet. So a uh, couple of quick questions. Um, Oz is asking about um, mixing piano, Mark. Um, he is saying that he feels like it's the hardest instrument for him to EQ. Well, I think Mark is really good at it, so that's a good question. So what? <laughs> it has to be a good piano or right. a really bad piano. Right, right. Like, <laughs> do not try to make a upright sound like a grand. No matter how hard you do it, it will never... I don't think I'm good at it at all. I, think... I hate it. <laughs> I'm serious. Like I love mixing piano. It's I one don't... of the first things I noticed about your mixes that I was like, wow, my sample piano came back sounding much more real. But even like real pianos, I don't, I don't do anything fancy. I mean, it was because I learned from two major players, Dennis Tusana, who's an amazing jazz uh, engineer in Chicago, Two full 14s. When I started working under Bill, two C12s. Very simple, don't complex, don't make it more radical than it needs to be. And if the instrument's well made and it sounds good, then that's great. If it's not and it needs to sound vibey, that's great too. I would take a upright piano a million years over any uh, baby grand, no matter what brand, mm -hmm. no matter what. And you can't make a baby grand sound like a full range Steinway D or a C7. Yeah. Or why would you want to? Because it's, yeah, it's not that. So trying not to do that. But there are little elements and tricks. You know, I know Bill used to put a full, like a, a Coles 4038 or a U47 on the belly of the C7 because it didn't have the bottom end or the dirtiness of the, the Steinway did. And just doing that, it kind of fills in a little bit, or it just makes it a little. I like, I like the frame, metallic. Just yeah. to get that metallic mono in there. There's loads of things you can do. You're right. The the source is the most important. I also like don't the parallel. compress on the way in on a piano. Yeah, parallel compression is absolutely the king, and I use the exact same setting every time on this Abbey Road Waves. I don't even know what plugin it is. It's the red channel strip. But it has the, oh, it's the one, two, three, four, because mm -hmm. it has the compressor and the EQ on it. I also it. think the other thing that's super important is like, what's what's the arrangement? Because yeah. I, if it's a if it's a pop rock well, don't song. Don't hit too hard unless it is calling for that. Yeah. Well, with Isaac, you couldn't help it. He just put, he put pianos out of tune. His left hand was so heavy, he could knock it out of tune. But uh, we, were tu we were tuning his Mason and Hamlin every day. He was just like. And then you become sensitive to that. Yeah. And overhearing the tune 
issue as a problem and sometimes it's okay to be it's the same as putting new heads on and stuff in a dense arrangement i'll take the piano and i'll, I'll like high pass really really aggressively like so i'm high passing just below 100 oh, so that's cool. quite aggressive but yeah i will insert back in a pair of Poltex at 100. So what I'm doing getting is... getting the color of it. Yeah, so what, I, what I'm doing is I'm like rolling off all the low end, but not like uh, not like this. I'm just like controlling it, gently rolling it off, and then dialing it back in with the Poltex just gives it a bloom in the low end. It's a little bit like I'll cut before I boost. I mean, Are you still running your stuff. VCAs on this? Yeah, not that often though. Wow. Not that often. Man. We do use it, but these days, it, unless you're, yeah, if you were, you're mixing film, you'd be running ECS yeah, yeah. all the time. I see it. Oh, jeez, I yeah. don't know. I don't know anyone that's on analog mixing that much. And I mean, I'm not saying they don't because they yeah. definitely do, but yeah. holy cow, recall would be. Whew. I mean, that's that's what it was for, for many decades. Many decades. But, but they also didn't have the recall the same. It usually was that's the mix. Okay. What was it? Jurassic Park? The theme was literally the board mix. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, not at all. It's ridiculous. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. But you're working with, like, when we were at Air a couple of years ago, we were talking about earlier. Um, the it was a full orchestra. I mean, it was an orchestra. It was insane, and they had timpani and they had uh, an opera singer who was doing this kind of like outro part. And you just forget when you're working with real musicians. Yeah. Everybody just came down, and you heard this ah, like over the top of it, and everybody's just in the room. So you come to mix, it's like deck a tree up, done. A little bit more timpani. What All right, was we're that? done. Yeah. I mean, Who's the singer in Seeger Raws? Josie or I can't remember the name. There's yet. a really neat video online if you type it in Seeger Raws, uh, Abbey Road, live at Abbey Road, where it's the full orchestra and then just him. Right. He doesn't have the headphones on. He doesn't do anything because it's that exact same thing of balancing around the singer, which is how they did everything. All the Sinatra records, yeah. all of the Scylla Black albums, all the Judy Garland albums, everything was done pre-headphones getting in and the band just going around and playing together and balancing. And that is 80% of mixes to me is that movement and that, that way that things breathe. That's why I really like expanding compression and stuff because it's poking and tickling and these cool little, that spiffy plug-in does these areas where you can just get a little bit of attack so it's bringing band out and it's almost doing what it used to be able to do which is like if you're playing in a group or recording in a group you can literally hear people kind of leaning in sometimes sure. and the specialness of like the little edgy flicks and stuff is really cool i'm not sure sojo what your question is is um question of how to mix a clean guitar sound with an overloaded one i mean for me I mean, it's it, just complimenting each yeah, other. Yeah, it's like a compliment. To me, if you want a pure, clean tone, that's probably where you have to get really judicious with the right use of compression. Because you want that pure mid range. Because like, the thing about a heavy guitar is it can be pretty scoopy, you know, which sometimes is too much. You know, I'm, I'm actually more on the mid range side on heavies. So I'll, I'll scoop a bit of 2K out on my heavies, but I'm always boosting pure mids you know seven eight hundred eight eight fifty one k is like very dave jordan all of those um addison chains records those jane's addiction was super middly guitars but if you're using a heavy guitar and a clean guitar playing at the same time i probably wouldn't boost that those frequencies on the heavy guitar i'd boost those on the clean guitar so the clean guitar would be like oh it's honky and mid-rangey so it had some, you know, some nose to it and then let the heavy guitar sit around it. I mean, again, though, how's your panning? That's if they're panned on top of each other. Right. One's panned on one side, one's panned on the other. And I'm going to use similar EQ on both because they've both got to take up the same space. But then George, or I can't remember if it was George Martin or Jeff Emmerich who said this was back in the mono days, you had to make personalities of the guitars because right. you'd have mm. to combine them and you'd have to say, this is John, this is George. And you have to be able to tell what is what. So that's why they started switching different microphones yeah. for different guitars. Yeah, they put KM56s on, on AC30s. Yeah. Which is insane. Completely blow up your microphone. It's insane. I've got one of that. I mean, yeah. 
put a fifteen thousand dollar microphone on an AC thirty going crang. <laughs> but yeah, they do that, and then they would put a, a dynamic, like two yeah. completely different styles of mics, because they both had the same amp. Different so personalities, they, yeah. yeah. Um, tons of great questions. Let's see if you keep going. Um, da -da. Capturing, performance, blah, blah, blah. Capturing a performance compared to creating a performance? I mean, yeah, you want to be all about capturing a great performance. Um, um, oh, uh, um, Davil Dodd. Brian oh. scored many films for me, films not in English. Please ask Brian, what is it like to find the emotional cues in a language he does not speak because story equals emotion and equals music? <laughs> Thanks for watching, David. He's the director of the, uh, the Zelensky the, movie. Oh, fantastic. Film. Hello. And I've done, I don't know, we've done eight, nine films together. Yeah, we did the, that Ten was films. the song that we were talking about, the, the East West track. Well, that is something. It's a great question about language. It is a great question. And it, it was a good lesson for me because the first film we did was a Russian language film. And I was like, how are we going to, like, do you have subtitles or like. Right. And, and, it, there's like a because there was I had the script right but because you're scoring to the performances sure. kind of your emotional body takes over absolutely and yeah. and you don't realize that you're that you have it all the time because we use words a lot yeah but once you start engaging it just it's kind of an autopilot that I think all of us have and David is like a he's he's so so responsive and so um, knowledgeable about film music to a scary degree that uh, he will he will get the intimidating presumably way, uh, it can be yeah. like he just yeah anyway he knows what he wants he really knows what he wants and he's thinking about music the entire time he's making the but movie. he's he's also a photographer and getting into these universes of yeah. all mixing every little nice kind yeah, of he different has a big big brain and a big big vocabulary for all of this stuff incredible uh, so he's delivering me performances that he already knows are going to bring musical um, solutions to that makes sense. That's probably the best way to say it. But for you, leaning on his question a little bit more, yeah. you don't speak the language. No. Um, you've got a script, but like you're saying, the, you know, you can, you can read a line on a page yeah. and without the inference of an actor, you don't really know what they're trying to say or you think you know what they're trying to say. And then you're like, oh, no, that's sarcastic. Oh, no, that's serious. Oh, no, that's comedic. Oh, I, was, no, that's I was watching Better Call Saul last night and there was a big chunk of it in Spanish, this one episode. And I, I funny, I was thinking about this last night about like, well, I knew exactly the temperament, not because he was getting angry, but because you can just, it, the phrasing of Spanish and American is very different, but you can still know what's happening just based off pacing you of can. a voice. And I've noticed that working on the handful of films yeah. for you and David, yeah. which is like, you know, what? not because the music's gonna get aggressive here, you really don't know that, but you can just sense based off of facial expressions or anything, which is why I think I said this in the, the video I did, which is David was very well at like, even Zelensky was very well as an actor of saying, if you didn't know his voice, you'd say, is that real? Because you can't, I mean, he's got a real raspy voice. But when you start listening to how he's delivering certain things in a language I don't understand, you watch their face. And if you can capture what the expression's doing, it doesn't matter what language. Well, this brings up another issue and a deeper issue. And we all have, are familiar with what Vladimir Zelensky looks like now when he's delivering a message and but maybe we haven't seen the full range of his uh, abilities um dramatically but the bigger issue and the deeper issue that it brings up is you're not always as a composer trying to score what you see you're trying to get behind the th you're trying to get to the thing behind the thing so for instance in the miyu he she film these these two people are applying for a divorce they're trying to get a divorce. The judge says no and has them list the reasons they're going to get it. They want a divorce and then tells them, you have to go do these things. You have to go through this process of exploring your relationship. So the music is saying, we're, we're staying curious about our relationship. The music is not going to say, we're shutting this down. We're mad at each other, even though that's what you see. 
the music is going to get behind behind the drama and say there's a part of us that's still curious about whether or not this can work and um, and so that exists in any language and that's why a foreign language film can be scored by someone who doesn't speak the language because right, we are right. trying to get to a deeper level absolutely yeah which is the music is whoever said that music is always the most expressive form of communication regardless of what type of it's why you see Japanese kids pretending to be John Lennon and the Beatles and the same time you see someone in Brazil doing the exact same thing because it's translated that emotion to all types of cultures yeah and which it is why I, it's, I've worked on a lot of different outside this country projects and I was thinking about like that's kind of a weird thing that I'm just like always jumping around and doing stuff in all these different environments but it's all music it's yeah. all relating to how does this emotionally connect to me yeah I do a lot of hand gestures <laughs> you do <laughs> just like so do I actually so we're, we're, we're in good hands here literally <laughs> um, uh, guitar Nakshak says Brian and Mark do you have any particular favorite scores and mixes um, I suppose what make them your favorite what inspire things that inspire you absolutely it, what, 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 what do you watch listen to many favorites I don't know where to look. I mean, one of my favorite, one of my aha moments in film scoring was hearing the score for The Village, that old M. Night Shyamalan film. Sure. How that was recorded just set off fireworks for me. It sounds very, very unique, delicious, just the amazing fidelity. Um, it's a James Newton Howard score. I mean, Black Hawk Down was another score that Hans Zimmer did, that the way it was produced and the way it sounds is completely different from many, many other film scores you'll ever hear. I mean, the list goes on and on. I don't know how many you want me to name, but th those are two that are polar opposites, right? Black Hawk Down is very dry in your face. It gets at the grit mm -hmm. of war. And the village is very uh, mysterious. And is it sort same of subtle and- James Newton Howard did both? No, no, no. Uh, Hans Zimmer did uh, Black Hawk Down. Yeah. Um, but there are all these extremes in film scoring because movies tell every story there is. So there's I have five favorites in every. Well, it's my <laughs> favorite, one of my favorite large sounding score is the Castaway soundtrack from Oh yeah. Alan Sylvester. That's a wonderful sound. The movie. other one that I got absolutely back in love with was Karate Kid 2. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's that right. happened because of COVID and I started getting into the Karate Kid again because of Cobra Kai and stuff. So I started listening to the music behind it. Who was that? Bill Conti? I believe so. Just yeah. unbelievable. But then I like Punch Drunk Love soundtrack, which was done movie. at Bill Schnee's. Very yeah. small, tight. It's a big room, but small and tight. That's John Bryan, right? Yeah. So it's very different, quirky, very different. beautiful, romantic sounding, smaller orchestras, which is where I kind of fell in love with the Henry Mancini stuff, where yeah. he traditionally didn't use 80-piece orchestras. He liked to use 25-piece arranging orchestras or something smaller Yeah, he just that just small. sounded better. And that's the thing I've kind of always liked. A lot of people want to get these giant orchestras. They start doubling these yeah. takes. And I've always been like, do you really want to do that? It sounds worse when you do it most of the time. It, yeah, it does. It does. I know why they're doing it a lot, but I, yeah, there's something beautiful about just having. And these are, I'm talking about the sounds of yeah. the recordings more than the writing necessarily. I love both of those sure. scores, but we were talking about sonics mostly. Yeah. Uh, well, just, I mean, whatever inspires you. Yeah. The sounds of those, I've always kind of held those up as like. For me, um, I, I agree with all those things. I think of like Lawrence of Arabia, Arabia or something like that. You know, those scores are insane. Um, yeah. I like big melody. I think growing up on classical music, you, you just get hit over the head with big melody, Beethoven, yeah. you know, just things, you know. Um, but my favorite favorite is also my favorite movie is is The Third Man. You know, it's a ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. Third Man is your yeah. favorite movie. Interesting. Oh, he's, yeah, it's yeah. probably most British people's favorite movie. We, we all love that movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, it always makes a top five list in, in in sort of you know Sunday Times magazine or whatever. Yeah. But um, but I do love the um, 
I love those sort of memorable things. But then I know what you're saying about overall feeling. You know, you watch something and you may not remember specific melody and stuff, but you walk away going, oh, that just felt so good with it. Um, yeah, Star Wars is hard to get away with, but then I did grow up with Pulse the Planets. So, I mean, like, you, you hear that and you're like, um, it's Pulse the Planets. You know what I mean? You hear all of those things all over it. You know, it's a very obvious kind of like, you know, putting that, that yeah. feeling into a movie. But know? even film score doesn't have to be orchestra related. It could be, you think of like Breaking Bad. Yeah. And think like, of Blade Runner. For Blade, kind of oh, Blade Runner. The original yeah, one, yeah. the original, yeah. the Vangelis. That's another one that yeah. has always stood out to me. I agree. Yeah. Blade Runner is a huge one. Yeah, that, that would, if I thought about it for more than five minutes, I would have put that in my top five. Yeah, Blade Runner is huge. Yeah. Because it's a sort of non-futuristic futuristic, because futuristic, it's, it's weird. You listen to it now, and we know as musicians that those synth sounds are, you know, quote-unquote dated. But, but the way that it was done, it's so cold that it fits so perfectly. I don't think anything could be better. It's just cold. It's like rainy and musty and everything that movie is. But it has it has enough charm and heart in it somehow. Yeah. Somehow, yeah, the yeah. ideas, the writing has has yeah. has this uh, ability to to to, to um, make you feel like warm enough to engage in the yeah. story. It's not just yeah. It's yeah, a I complicated agree. milieu. <laughs> that, that score. Um, um, David's asking a question, which I, 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 he's just saying, what is, I mean, he's asking, what do you have to say about the score to help scene transitions? And how, I suppose, how do you approach that? I mean, scene transitions. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I, mean I mean, that's your job, isn't it? I mean, as a composer to sit there and, and people are saying to you, OK, here's a moment where this, we're, we're, we're lulled into this full sense of everything's beautiful. And then this big moment happens. Reverb. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think I think that's an interesting question. As as obvious as it seems, like I don't think I've been asked that question before. But I, I think that something that we were talking about earlier is the thing behind the thing. You have to be careful with transitions to not play what's on the screen as much as what's either be sensitive to what you're leaving and if mm -hmm. that needs to linger and overlap into the next scene, or whether you can you can pre you know announce. Right. What's happening next? Well, and you have one time in the entire movie to make a statement. Don't do it five times. Don't do it five times. Yeah. So this is a convert. This is probably a bit of a conversation piece with the director, um, which uh, uh, he always knows the answer to. <laughs> right. Right. So sometimes you're trying out three or four ideas, and and then you you're, you're getting guidance from the the director. For sure. And you know, like I said, David specifically is so specific. There's not usually three or four tries. There's one or two but but a lot of times directors i've noticed other people that i've worked with need a little more they need stuff to choose from right, so you right. give them three or four and they go oh yeah i didn't realize that was something that i wanted but that works great so it, it just depends on the situation but it's going back to our acquired knowledge it's acquired knowledge and mm -hmm. it takes a very long like you said 20 years yeah. before you were doing the records you imagined yourself doing yeah it's a long time sometimes yeah, and those records I would imagine myself doing, I was going back in at the lowest level to get back up to it. And the other thing yeah. is to think about the guys that I knew that were doing, that moved fast, aren't really doing it anymore. So I think it's important to know that taking your time into this industry, even if it takes five, 10 years, this is your love. Yeah, It's a journey. Like, yeah, I, I'm very aware that in two years, I could have half the amount of work that I have now. And so you have to use that as a process of, as you say, like trusting things happening for a reason, yeah. taking the opportunity you can when you can, be ready for the opportunity you can yeah. when you can. Yeah, find your own fire for doing it. So let's do a quick rapid fire. Any questions before we wrap up here? Um, this, uh, some, Joey says uh, the, the game in his house was, his Christmas game in his house was uh, um, humming soundtracks and it was like star wars superman raiders of the lost ark i mean those are all big melodies big big melodies yeah those are big yeah uh yeah i will tell you one story about david we were at the hollywood bowl one time and uh i don't remember what the piece of music was that we were listening to but um david has a twin brother mark and they both grew up humming playing this game they're absolute astonishing experts about it 
and the, a melody came through the orchestra a piece that was playing and they both looked at each other and went oh that's like that's like this theme from born on the fourth of july and they both start humming like not even the main theme like some buried theme somewhere that goes with some character that i don't i didn't really i don't remember that movie that much but these guys dig out they have an amazing vocabulary uh if i were going to play this game with them i'd have to i'd have to go hard i have to dig yeah. <laughs> just to stump them is yeah. my point yeah yeah my family plays that game but we use like b-list actors oh that's the guy from captain ron he was the guy in the background and captain ron exactly exactly uh i'm just gonna say yes to this question from all of us but uh it, um sobon sober nodal go oh sober sober noodle god says do you guys think it's possible to make a living with mixing and mastering without any qualification except for being very good at it yes of course yeah just being good at stuff is, <laughs> yeah. yeah going back a couple of people are coming in late so if you go back to watch at the beginning because we talk a lot about what people are asking here uh david uh, david in italy says what's your best tip tip for someone um who would like to walk this path i would go back to the beginning because we talked about really about how to get in the in, into the industry whether it be mixing or composing or combination of the both is really just being a worker on, amongst workers being able to interact with people and that's a big deal but watch it from the beginning because there's a lot of talk about that um oh dr Zhivago, yeah i agree what a masterpiece that is um oh any uh, any morricone all of his stuff is incredible. oh he's, he's one of my favorites yeah <laughs> dun, 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 dun. yeah did you guys see Hateful Eight? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. That, the opening scene of Hateful Eight. I was going to say yeah, the opening yeah. scene. Oh, it just blew my mind. Oh, my head's just so... standing on end. I love Ennio Morricone. Yeah. Oh. So happy for him to have won the Academy Award for that. Oh, he deserves yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah, finally. Yeah. Absolutely insane how influential he is. Leave me alone. We, we, were, we were talking about um, uh, um, New Order Blue Monday, and the little bass melody is... Ennio Morricone and they, oh, they name yeah. check him and say yeah. yeah yeah we just took that little melody from it's like so it's you know so massive because the movies being such a massive underground success and culturally so relevant that little pieces of melody just seep into pop music and it's beautiful what a wonderful thing um David who's Italian says I've met Ennio Morricone he was so um I was so lucky because he was in a mood to talk yeah <laughs> nice um, and David says he will go back to the beginning to watch. Um, uh, oh, the TV series Micro Men. I can't remember that. Oh, I've got to go back and watch that. A BBC TV show. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, what electronic music style or sounds besides trailer do you love most in film and TV? Oh, this is Isomatic. They were, they were saying that they're mainly an electronic musician and they just felt as an electronic musician, how could they break into film and tv i oh, mean it's it's everywhere it's super cool like uh, have you, you guys seen under the skin mm -hmm. I, I think um mika levy i don't know if i'm pronouncing her name correctly that is one of the coolest electronic scores these, these guys have a, i mean if you're in electronic music you definitely have you know a future in this in film scoring it's 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 going that way hard yeah and so much sound design work. i mean stranger things do oh, i yeah. need to say yeah. it anymore <laughs> yeah 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 there's a there's a ton of work for it don't um don't please don't be discouraged it's not all it's not all about um orchestral stuff although there, there has been a big move back to it which i it's sort of it's classy classic and timeless I it mean, is sort of timeless yeah yeah just absolutely amazing yeah um see if we have any quick questions uh jerry says electronic music blade runner was amazing absolutely uh Brian, I love your Across the Multiverse. I first heard it on Mark's SSL video. What was your inspiration for the track? I love the hybrid approach I'm currently doing on Mockup as it's so cool. Uh, Interstellar, the film Interstellar was, was, right. was the inspiration for that. Um, I even think, sometimes I do this, sometimes as an experiment, I'll just take a trailer, because you can download trailers and rescore them. I'll do that. And sometimes they end up being pieces that get licensed and I think I actually did just rescore the interstellar trailer with that piece of music and um it ended up being you did that with Tron somewhere. too I did it with Tron I did it with amazing yeah it's just kind of a good it's just way. a very healthy way it's almost like practicing yeah. listening to the Beatles and go how did they get that drum sound 
you yeah. kind of put that sound into your template and you kind of work around it or inspire off of it. So Absolutely. you're you're inspiring off the visual. Yeah. And it brings you into a lot of things of this is how That's a great way by the way to if you have downtime to get something done that means something. It's like because... a template to how to do it too. Yeah. Cuz after a while you're just going to know this way of the editing patterns and stuff and that will cue you to how you edit your music. Yeah. Because it's some kind of trend happening in trailer music, which is as trendy as rock and roll. Yeah. It keeps changing. Yes, it does. <laughs> and it's based around the temperament of like how things kind of build and clack and build and slack and what instruments you use. So study trailers, study action trailers hard. For sure. Because yeah. that's very really, it's way more up to date with trends than movies because trailers are updated constantly to the point where like by the time it's up it's already out it's a good way to it's a good way to build your chops um and and that is paramount <laughs> to, to doing anything um so to, come on really quick question for you mark are you mixing entirely in the box no so what what hybrid stuff are you do well, I mean, I do mix in the box on film stuff a lot. Not always. I mean, the way I have it set up is I use a summing amplifier, an EQ, and a compressor. Hardware reverb. But I've said this many times, like, you don't, you don't get the mix to sound good because you're out of the box. You get it to sound good because of balance. The out-of-the-box stuff make, just gets you quicker of the sound you have in your head. Sonically, there's elements that resemble things or it softens things in a specific way that works a lot better than putting four plugins on it. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, there are many albums I have that I've done the entire album, and one or two might have in the box mixes, and the rest are out. And a year later, after master, I have no idea, nor do I even care at that point. I can't tell. I don't know. It's not that I can't tell the difference between the two. It's just the out-of-the-box feature is not going to save you. It's a specific <laughs> sound. Yeah. And it's really hard to get without it. So, Brian, I'm going to finish with you. Okay. And, um, oh, you know, Carsten does say, do you, do you still mix it? Hey, he has asked it like three times. I forgot. Do you still do you check stuff and mix in mono ever? No. I saw a video the other day about a guy, I won't name his name because he's a nice guy, but he's talking about like mixing on five speakers. And I'm just like, what? Why on earth would you do that? Like, I believe... So the opposite of mono. <laughs> mono. Mono is tricky because I don't care. Like... I mix for stereo for the presentation because I do so much things in panning and balances are based off panning because the second you put it in mono, it throws everything off anyways because mm. I hard pan a guitar or something. Yeah. And at the second that goes in the center, your snare is not going to be as loud. Sure. So it's hard. It's a devil's triangle. As Ken Calais says, devil's triangle. If you get yourself into a place where you're checking four, I mean, four speakers is a very dangerous way. I would do headphones and my main speakers or main speakers and maybe the little Bose stereo thing just to hear what the low end's doing. The second you get into monoizing stuff, for me, it's the, it, you, it never, it, you're never gonna be safe with what, mono stereo, there's a reason why they're different. So just as long as you're not doing some wicked stuff to the stereo file, like spreading, you can spread one element hard and that will be phasey in the mix once you collapse it. But if you stereo or spread the stereo really hard... It's a disaster. It's a disaster. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm the same way. I'll, I'll take a synth pad that I don't, can't get out of the middle and, and spread it. Other than that, may, maybe some fake strings spread out of the way, maybe. But exactly. Anything, anything exactly. Else, it's a disaster. So I have two questions for you, uh, Brian, to finish up. First one is from Karen. Hi, Karen. Karen says, uh, what DAW do you work in? Logic. Mostly Logic. Pro Tools as well. Uh, Logic for composition, Pro yeah. Tools. Logic for sequencing, composition, all that yep. stuff. And I, I, I don't need to leave Logic very often. 
Right. It's, if if we track, we'll do a lot of tracking over, you know, string sessions in Pro Tools. And then sometimes I'll, I'll have to make a decision. Am I going to import logic into Pro Tools or the other way? Right. So. And here's the last question. Um, and it's sort of a combination of all of the sense of what people are asking. I suppose it's this. It's um, what's the one thing that you, I suppose, everybody wants to know how to get into the side. Like we started off talking about film and TV composition. It, for a musician is is like a, ooh, you know. Um, we always make jokes about actors, for instance. You know, uh, Tom Cruise at one stage, probably more, was getting paid 17 million per movie and doing two to three movies a year. Mm -hmm. Many successful musicians in the world, if you told them they're going to make 17 million the whole career, they'd be quite happy. Yeah, We, we see film and TV as this big, you know, uh, potential to 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 earn the kind of rock and roll money that we would associate with the bands of old. So there's a lot of people that are interested in this. What is the one piece of advice in all of this conversation? I know it's a horrible it's throw a you under the bus. Almost like I suppose another way of asking the question is, what what do you know now that you wish you had known when you began? How that's about a, that? That's another way. It'd be hard it. because the timing and everything has changed so much over the course of the last 12 years. Yeah. In the last three years. And what you know now, yeah. what would you be telling your, your, yourself? I'd say a, big, you know a big thing I would tell myself is money can't be the reason. Uh, right. It can't be a reason. It can't even be a top three reason, really. Right. I mean, it shouldn't ever it's hard be. to hear and it's hard to tell yourself that because you want success. Yeah. Everybody does who does this. Uh, but the re if you pursue your craft first pursue relationships next and pursue some kind of significant personal growth that those have to be way more important and if you do that uh y you will you will light that fire that i keep talking about in yourself as to why you're doing this anyway and that will that will make it so you can survive because you're going to have to you're going to be faced with I don't know if I can survive this or not. So once you have built that, you will survive. Okay. Number two, the people that stick around and don't quit, we hear this a lot. Mm -hmm. The people that they, they tend to at some point find some success. So timing. Yeah. And you never Brian know Cranston when that's was like, happen. how old when he, he said he was like, it took forever for it to finally kick in takes a long it can take a very 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 long time and so i would I, yeah that's what i would say money can't be it like you can't be thinking about you said this too like you can't be thinking well i'm ready to go do the a-list albums i've always dreamt of well you might have the talent for it but there's, there's so much more to be built and you have to enjoy every level you have to enjoy you it can't too. just say i don't like this music so i don't want to do it that i don't that doesn't make sense to me I try to achieve any kind of happiness in anything I do, regardless of if it's amazing or if it's just like, okay, this is good. This guy's really, really trying to get his music yeah. to be where he wants it to be. And I want to help him do that. Like, that's my job is to help. It's not to do anything. Yeah. It's to help. Yeah. And we have to remember that. I, I mean, guess. obviously working hard is, is on that list before money. So money might be five or six, but money will come is the point. Yeah, I always say, uh, do what you love and make money as a consequence. Yeah, as a consequence. Yeah. That's, I wish somebody really helped me believe that when I was, you know, starting out. So that's it. Fantastic. Gentlemen, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> Firm handshake from Brian there. That, that was, was my uh, little... Uh, the wet, yeah. wet lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. It was great. Fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And great questions, everybody. And, uh, and, and very well behaved. We only got one, 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 one kind of, uh, what were they trolling? Like striptease thing or something that came up? They oh, is that what they wanted? They only had one. What happened? I mean, come on, people. Eric needs something extra to do. <laughs> no, it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you for produced and engineered by Eric Von Gonzalez. Thank Ladies you, and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Please, if you've come in recently, go back to the beginning because Brian and Mark talked a lot about, you know, how they came up and the, and the lessons they learned. And really, it's a pretty fantastic video. I love this format of having three of us. Hmm. This is really good. We should do this again.
Yeah, I mean, it was very easy. <laughs> it, it is, isn't it? There's like never a lull and, yeah. and, and there's all these different perspectives. But even though the perspectives may be different, they're all intertwined and, and aligned because we've all had that same experience. None of us like did a record at 19 and made a million dollars. It was all just like... Lord, I want to. Well, yeah. I mean, you never come down from it's that. It's kind of That's like this. Peak. That's your peak at 19. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. So Thank long, farewell, au revoir, adios, tutsins. Uh, goodbye. Ciao. Ciao.